Hey, yo, what's good? What's good? What's good? Welcome to Reflections of a DJ to Roll podcast presented by DJ City and Beat Source. I'm one of your hosts, DJ Crooked. We got Jamie the Great here. Yeah. Big shout to our boy, Never Never Forever. We have a special guest. We actually have two special guests. Yep. Hey. Um, I heard about this DJ when I left New York, mm-hmm. kind of in the late 2000s, mid late 2000s. Huh? And he, you know, he represents a, a generation of New York DJs that uh, that I kind of missed, you know, like because I, I was I was in Vegas mm-hmm. and he kind of took the reins over <laughs> towards the late 2000s. And, you know, this is around the era of like Ten June stereo. You know, I personally loved his mixtapes back then. You know, the mixes you were doing, I, I thought you had great taste in music. And you were wildly talented as a DJ. Thank mm-hmm. you. And, uh, you know, a very gifted producer. And I, I would say early on, we started noticing that he was one of the more savvy, uh, business-minded DJs at the time. Thank Still you. You know, which is why he's also, you know, a co-owner of uh, 4AM Talent um, Management here in New York, That's on right. the East Coast. And uh, he's brought along his CEO. Hey. Uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, welcome DJ Chachi and Madison back. Woo! How y'all doing? Thank you. Good to have you guys. <laughs> when I talk to Chachi, when I talk to you, you're like, oh, can Madison sit with us? And I was sure. like, yeah, you know, and Absolutely. I was like, definitely. And and first off, I, I appreciate you guys, you know, uh, uh, coming through and showing love at uh, Nevis Memorial, his uh, funeral services. Thank you. Guys. Absolutely. You know, it meant a lot. Yeah. Um, but as, as soon as you had Madison sitting, I'm okay, I'm like, this is going to be a 4 a.m., Talent agency or something, right? <laughs> to recruit, y'all, y'all here to no. like re- no. recruit more <laughs> DJs, recruit more no. DJs. East Coast? No, how do no. we apply? Is what people are saying right now. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> don't, no, don't, just don't, <laughs> don't text me. <laughs> That's not, yeah, don't, don't no. slide. <laughs> um, no, it's like I can't imagine doing a podcast like this without Madison involved yeah. because she has been such a big part of my career and life. I mean, she's the person that I talk to. Every day, mm-hmm. constantly, the mo you know, it's like she's everything. So, right. like, I can't imagine doing this. That's exactly that. how I feel about Crooked over here. Yeah. He's my every day. I'm your, I'm your Madison back. <laughs> You're my Madison back. <laughs> also, he always makes a point of making sure I have a seat at every table, which mm. I just appreciate so what much. She deserves it. I mean, she's she's the backbone of like our company, like. As many of our DJs will, they'll always call me. And yeah. I'm like, no, I'm <laughs> like, talk to Matt. Well, I, I want to talk about you in, in the 2000s as a DJ. Sure. I, I definitely want to talk about that. Yeah. But let's talk about when, like, uh, about, uh, you know, 4 a.m. right now. Okay. And Madison, your involvement as a CEO, when mm-hmm. you guys linked up. Sure. You know, you've always been the most business minded DJ from what I've mm-hmm. seen. Like, I don't know, maybe in the late 2000s when Foxwoods, when uh, this nightclub Shrine was opening, mm-hmm. there was a couple investors coming in and then it was like Chachi's investing. And I was like, really? I'm like, I felt like you were only DJing for like, from what I've known and right. what I heard for like three or four years. And I'm yeah. like, wow, he's really saved up enough money to <laughs> invest in a nightclub, um, you know? At that time, I was still living home. Yeah. So um, I was a resident at Murmur, which was this gift and the curse because I was... In Atlantic City. In Atlantic City. In a City. Borgata. Right. They were known for their Mondays, right? Murmur Mondays. They were... The Murmur Mondays was... Unforgettable. Like, unforgettable, yeah. but they were like bumping like Friday, Saturday, and yeah. Monday. But I mean, Mondays was undeniable. Yeah, you couldn't yeah, get yeah. around it. It was... It was like crazy. everyone was talking about... Murmur Mondays. Murmur Mondays, yeah. For sure. It was crazy. Um, So I was doing... I was the resident there Fridays, Saturdays, and Mondays. Wow. So I would stay there from Friday... To Monday, I would mm-hmm. come home Tuesdays, do stereo Tuesday night. Mm. Uh, I would be off on Wednesday, Thursday. I would do ten June, and then Friday, and then I would go back. So then I lived home, had no bills. Where where, where did you live? Well, you're from Long Island, yeah. Right? I grew up in Long Island. So were you in Long Island? Yeah. And then you were driving to Atlantic City. I was taking the bus. Taking a bus. Yeah, I used wow. to take the Long Island Railroad to the city, take Greyhound down, and then Greyhound back. And <laughs> so you were taking better. public transportation. Jesus. Why? Because you were drinking or what? No, it's just saving money, bro. It's just easier, honestly. Like you get on the bus, you pass out, and a couple hours you get there. So what? How many <clears> hours <throat> is it from it's Long Island? Two, well, the two train to the city is forty-five minutes, yeah. and then you got to get from Penn Station to the Port Authority. So that's the subway, and then uh, the Port Authority to Atlantic City, which is another two and a half hours. Yeah. Oh shit! <clears throat> and if you so when you were doing this, that Greyhound. 
is brutal. <laughs> yeah, that greyhound sounds it's, brutal as fuck. Yeah, so because you, greyhounds <laughs> like greyhounds like gross. I yeah, mean, it is gross. That's why I was like, terrible. why are you tra- taking that? But so it was you, like thirty dollars or something. You were there Friday, Saturday, and Monday. And Sunday, and so Sunday, Sunday I would just stay there and do nothing. So you were doing days. three hour, a three hour, six hour round trip commute. Yeah, every no every for the whole weekend, right? I would go down on uh, Friday afternoon, and then I would come home uh, Tuesday, Tuesday morning. morning. Oh, where would you? You had a place to stay. They gave me a room there. Oh, okay, yeah. that kind of works out. Yeah, it I was, thought you were you were no, going there every night. Going oh, that's God. crazy. No, every night going, going back and forth. Was, no, that was that would be nuts. <laughs> That that's a lot. insane, bro. That's a lot. I would literally actually catch, I think it was like a 4.15 a.m. bus home. So like the club would close at 4. I would have my luggage in the DJ booth and I would book it to the bus station just to get home because I had I wanted to go home. I hadn't been home in a days. Right, right. Jeez. Yeah. So this was, was that era. That was that and, era. And this is when you were kind of like established because you got, you got the industry night at Stereo I and, had, and June. I right? was like, I was... On the come up. Like, come I was up. bubbling in New York before that. What's the year around this? Like, what's this um, time? I was trying to do, like, some Googling on what year this was, and I think it was, like, 06, 07. Okay. Like, I'm not sure when Murmur opened. But um, I had already been a resident at 10 June, and I had, um, I think I had just left Home and Guest House Thursdays to go to 10 June, which was the coolest club, like, on the planet. Like, that residency really kind of set me off. Right. Most of the country pretty much respected that residency so much that they were like, come on in. Like yeah. other cities, they were like, let's go. Bring it in here. And that was like Mark and Eugene. <clears throat> that was really how that they was made their, their first, mark, right? That was their yeah. first spot. 10 June is actually their birthday. They both have the same birthday. It's June 10th. Mm. Uh, so that's where their name come from. Wow. Um, like where did you, how did you get into the New York scene? Because I, I, I saw that you were doing like weddings. Right. And, so, then, and someone named you Chachi who was in charge yeah. of the weddings. Yeah. So I was, um, <laughs> so the way it really starts is that I was a bus boy at a, um, uh, a catering hall in Long Island called Chateaubriand, which mm-hmm. just closed. And I met, uh, somebody that was DJing a wedding, yeah. um, this guy, Diego. And I was 16 at the time. And I was like, I'm a DJ. I was already DJing. I started DJing when I was 14 and I was doing, Middle school dances, teen nights, um, 18 and overs, like that kind of shit in Long Island. You were doing like your brother's like college parties. parties. Frat yeah. parties, wow. yeah. Is my demo, is my bio up there? <laughs> it's out there. So my dad, uh, bless his soul, he would, uh, I was in 10th grade, so I'm 15, and he would drive me to the club in Long Island, this like one club on uh, Post Avenue. He the would, it, no, this was an 18 and over, so I'm still Ooh. in high school. And my parents were like, if you want to go do this, you just have to go to school the next day. That's okay, I, I don't know anything about Long Island, right? Okay. What were you playing? Because I'm uh, imagining... Hip-hop. Definitely hip-hop. Hip-hop? Sure. Yeah. But I'm imagining the crowd, because I'm ignorant, like Manhattan, <laughs> like, you know, New York guy. Right. Is So, like, I'm thinking the crowd is very, like, Jersey Shore. Yeah, yeah. that's what I'm thinking, No, It wasn't... That era didn't happen yet. Like this is like ten years prior. Yeah, this is ninety seven. Yeah, you know, oh. um, I started in ninety six. This is like ninety seven, ninety eight, and I would he would drive me to the club with mm-hmm. my crates because it's all records, and I would literally sit outside the club on my crates and wait for him to pick me up at four o'clock in the morning. Wow! And then he would take me home. I would get a couple hours of sleep, and then I would go to school. So what were you playing? Like it was just all hip hop. Yeah, it was all hip hop. Really? Yeah, hundred percent. How mean, much money were you making at this point? Uh, like nothing, and I also don't remember. But like, oh. it couldn't have been a couple hundred dollars, you know. And you were like, and then you were like, had another job on the side. You were in college because you have no, like I'm in it, high school. He's high school. He's fourteen, fifteen years old. <laughs> I'm in tenth grade. Wow. So there was really a right. shortage of DJs, DJs in Long Island. Island. Yeah. I, well, I was <laughs> a shortage of budget. Recru- yeah. If they're recruiting fourteen-year-olds, yeah. I was doing this one promoter's teen nights, and yeah. he was like, "Oh, I do eighteen and overs too. You're really good. Why right. don't you come do them?" And I was like, "Okay." And then on the weekends, I was a busboy. So I met a guy at Chateaubriand. He was like, "When you turn seventeen, come uh, and get your license." You can come work for me. And you're spending all your busboy money on records. 100%. Everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Um, so I started doing weddings for him when I was 17. So I have this like chunk of time that I was doing weddings, sweet 16s, bar mitzvahs, you know, um, whatever, baby showers, like anything. But I was like gigging. I was doing like four and five a weekend. So I do like one Friday night, double Saturday, double Sundays. Damn. 
<laughs> so, um, and then I like started to try to do some stuff in New York. I used to do Exit on uh, Friday nights yeah. with uh, Breeze and BMI. So I was doing the hip hop room. Mm. I was this, this little white kid uh, doing the either the red room or the white room or the roof because Exit had so many rooms back then. Uh, Exit is now Terminal 5, if you can think about how big that goddamn club was. Huge club. It was huge. Massive. And I think when I was doing it, it was called Earth. Or it was when Junior Vasquez uh, was the resident on the main floor. So I would literally have to wait to get paid at like four or five o'clock in the morning. So I would finish and I would go down to the main floor and Junior Vasquez was like a predominantly gay DJ. And I was like, why, why is it only like guys here? And I was like, why has everybody got their shirts off? Like I didn't, I didn't even right. know about like homosexuality at that point in my life. I was like super confused. It was a late night kind of after hours. Too, for right? sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And at that time it's fucking late. People are all doing drugs. I didn't know what drugs were. I mean, right. like I was such a sheltered kid. I mean, I always so tell much people. Innocence. I was, I was 20. Long Island kid in Manhattan. <laughs> yeah. Manhattan for the first time. <laughs> 5 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. I Why mean, that- I like literally didn't know what sushi was until I was like 26. I mean, like I'm this sheltered Long Island kid. My mom never let me leave. <laughs> so, Except to the 18 and over. There it is. Yeah. But my father had to like push that through. So then. Um, did you learn? Did you like kind of like listen to like what Junior Vasquez was playing? For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was that your introduction to house? And, and that was, I mean, Tony Draper was a big one in New York, but that yeah. was like such a different kind of house. It was right. like, almost like hard style kind of mm-hmm. house. Um, so like I was starting to get like, oh, what's this? And like, you know, new influences. And besides that, I really only <coughs> had my older cousins, which would make me listen to Glenn Frischer on Hot 97, mm-hmm. which was like before Hot 97 was like hip hop station. This yeah. was house music. Glenn is yeah. a house DJ. It, it, like Hot 97 was like a, a basically a freestyle station in yeah. the 90s and it became like more dancey. Right. It had yeah. um, these weird radio shows, well, not weird, but like they had radio shows late night that would be like off brand. So it was like a hip hop station during the day, I think. Mm. And then at night it would have house DJs. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, I'm thinking on 97 in the 80s. I'm yeah, sorry. this is a little in bit. In the 80s was like freestyle. Mm-hmm. And then it was like, oh, okay. I didn't know they played dance music in the 90s. They had like late night radio shows where just DJs would have slots or like have like an hour or a couple hours. Okay, and okay. I think they actually might have been live broadcasts from like the Jersey Shore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Damn. So, all right. So then from Exit, like where, how did you how did you get into like Tenjun? And so and I actually stopped i was doing exit um and i like didn't love like they were like trying to like pay me via like my guest list it was like real clunky you weren't making shit no i was making no money a hundred dollars a night barely yeah barely and i was like you know i had to bring all my friends because i had to carry my crates up the stairs there was no elevator and exit you know like so So they were giving you a ride from long i would drive everybody okay but i would have to bring you know we're talking like six hours of right. vinyl so that's like i don't know how many fucking crates back then that's maybe four crates five crates so i'd have to bring all my friends from home come in they would have to have me carry everything up it was like a thing for me to get this done i'm making no money and i was like you know fuck this i'm just gonna go back to the weddings and i was doing really really well i was yeah. doing like 250 dollars a wedding so like I'm, and then your name was DJ Sync, yeah. <laughs> at the time, yeah, S Y N C. Okay, and it was before In Sync came out. You and got they bullied. scooped you. Yeah, it was. They were like, "This is this." Time. Where did that name come? You just named yourself. Yeah, Sync? I was just like looking around. And, okay, you know, trying to find like a cool word DJ or terms. some shit. DJ terms. <laughs> it's such a generic name. Yeah, right? um, DJ yeah. Sync. Yeah, it was it was terrible. So I started work at this. <laughs> company it's like maybe, DJ, it's like dj mixer <laughs> mixer <laughs> dj mixer yeah. dj rewind <laughs> dj fader yeah yeah go ahead. um so i started working at this other mobile dj company called body rock and one of the owners the company everyone had nicknames they were calling our owner the actual like owner of the nightclub um the company the polar bear he was, bear. He actually kind of. This is like what it was named. Come body rap. Body rock. Body rock. Yeah. And they did. They did only weddings and events. Weddings, sweet sixteens, bar mitzvahs, uh-huh. like all that. So one of the owners was like, "You look like Scott Bayo from Happy Days. We're gonna call you Chachi." And I was like, "I'm it like 17 stopped. I'm like, okay, like whatever. I'm not gonna lie. When I first heard the name, like, G, like, like, you know, I would come to New York. You like it I, fits? I, well, no, no. Everyone's <laughs> like, you know, oh, does this dude DJ uh, Chachi? 
He's kind of killing it right now. And I was like, that's the worst. So corny. <laughs> that's the worst. I, the first time I saw his name was on at the and, uh, in Hollywood at Playhouse. Yeah. It said, like, it was like, I forgot who was before him on a Friday, but then it's just like DJ Chachi on a Saturday. Yeah. And I was like, ah, oh, boy or girl, don't know. Until <laughs> I got there, and I was like, oh, it's a dude. My whole career, people were like, your name is awful. Please change that. Like, yeah. specifically, like, David Grutman but it's, from it's, the, it's, was yeah. like, oh, yeah. dead, dead that. Like, yeah, because it's... <laughs> but it's I think like, I have a tia named Chachi. That's why I was like, I don't know if it's a boy or girl. It means something in so many languages. Yeah, Everybody yeah. comes up to me. It's like um, in, Ur- in Urdu, like, Pakistani culture. It's like it, ants. Yeah, yeah, I think it's ants. Yeah. Paternal aunts or something. Yeah. It, it, but it, it specifically almost represents... A, like a clientele, a crowd, a bridge and tunnel crowd mm. that really? that these high end clubs don't want. Mm. Interesting. So do you know like these Jersey Shore, yeah, yeah, like Chachi uh-huh. kind of like you know like yeah. this bridge and tunnel crowd that high end bottle service nightclubs they don't want. Right. Yeah. So it's almost like you know like I don't know if we want that like kind of that those muscle heads. that element yeah, yeah juice like, heads jersey around. Shore, yeah. juice heads <laughs> juice heads those fist pumping you know jersey Get them guys out of here. right cuz chachi just sounds like you know like one of the just, italian just boys from that. the jersey you know yeah. so when i heard it i was like wow they, chachi's doing this uh-huh. and then, and then and i think and then you know as it as time went on it was just it just became like cool like a it household just became name. a part of you yeah yeah we came right yeah um, yeah, but we were definitely Chachi. What the fuck? Is <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know you were. What's a boy that all about? You overcame your yeah. name. I know. I had to fight through <laughs> <I> mean, <the laughs> pushback. <laughs> but I love that you stuck with it just yeah. because you didn't want to come up with another name. Yeah, right? it's like I had already been kind of successful with it. It was yeah. just like then to start over, and it's like oh, fuck, okay, fuck. This. So all right, so right, you're <clears> doing these weddings, right? Right. So then um, now I'm in college. So I went to school for audio engineering with a minor in business. Um, I got my associates from five towns in Long Island, and then I went to the School of Audio Engineering in the city, finished that uh, program, which was like nine months, and then I started working in recording studios. Um, So I'm still doing um, weddings on the weekend. I'm doing a nine to five during the week in the city, working at a post-production house on Madison Avenue called uh, Audio Mixers. So what were we doing, like mastering, mixing? We were recording um, TV and radio commercials, so like... Um, Siemens, Sealy's, AT and T, Mercedes Benz, all their radio, those like ads, um, wow. all ads and stuff. Very I tedious, was, right? Yeah, yeah, it was like, and I was actually really good. So the engineer knew that I knew what I was doing, so mm-hmm. he would let me run the <coughs> sessions. But I was getting seven dollars an hour, right? And they were billing these clients like, you know, five hundred an hour or something like that. So I'm doing that, still doing my Thursday nights in Long Island at this club called Oz in Hempstead, and then. Also, the weddings on the week. So I'm working eight days a week. <laughs> so give me a timeline. What's the year around this point? Uh, I, grew, I graduated high school in 2000. So this is 01, 02. 01, 02. Yeah. Right after 9-11. Yeah. Right. 100%. Mm-hmm. I was in, uh, 9-11 was my first day of college. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Right. I remember waking up to go to school, watching the towers come down with my brother. Yeah, and then yeah. I actually went to school and we were just like, I don't know what to do. Do we do school? Like, yeah, yeah. do we not do school? It was just like a that weird day. And then, so what? So then, what was next? Um, then I'm in college, and I start working with two friends of mine, and we start a hip hop mixtape mixtape team called Tape Masters Inc. So yeah, because mixtapes were big at that time. Yeah, yeah massive. Were, I mean, a lot uh, of people were trying to come up on mixtapes. Green tapes. Lantern, yeah. like Clue, so, Envy, yeah, Desert so Storm. That's kind of what audio schools were really based out of. They were like kids that made beats, right? Band dorks, um, like that, you know. And that's pretty much it. Honestly. There were two, like there was a couple mixtape scenes. One was like the exclusives, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, there was a, there was a few. There was like, like Clue, right? That had like the exclusives, mm-hmm. right? Like versus. It became this like this new mixtape era where like you you want you had like the labels were pushing or you had like unreleased tracks on your shit. Yep. Yeah. And the labels were either working with the mixtape DJ sure. or, yeah. or they were just like, How the fuck did you get this version? They used right? us as promo. So yeah. um my two partners at the time were Lex and Wex and um they were doing internships in the city. So one was had an internship at like uh Rockefeller and then the other one had an internship at Jive. So they had all these promos. All these promos. They would like have those little recorders with them and they would get like drops from P 
Kitty Crack or like uh, Freeway. So or in your head, that. you're thinking this is an edge, right? A little bit. <sighs> like I can I can do these mixtapes and maybe get Absolutely a bigger name. Not. No? I had no idea. No? I had no idea what the fuck it was. I was not a hip hop guy. I didn't like really know. I was just good at what I did. I was their engineer. Wait, you're not a hip hop. You, you really? Yeah, I mean, like, you started, but like not. I mean, like I was a hip hop DJ. You're not like a like, street, like no, a street like, hip hop. Yeah, you no, was not even a little bit. You don't like, like that no. shit. Um, but his I name was, was Chachi. Like, yeah. So Chachi. <laughs> <laughs> I was their engineer. So like they would do all this work. They would get all uh, the okay. all the music. They would get the freestyles. Like you know, like when the A Marie beat came out, there was like. 19 freestyles that came over that yep, beat, right. and like I would splice them all together. So I was the engineer. So I'm doing that in college, and then Wex goes, um, this guy that we know, Johnny Shipes, who... Oh, my God. Johnny, <laughs> Johnny Shipes was a promoter back then. Yeah. He, what's the record label that he started? He, he manages, like, Joey Badass now or something. Bro, he's discovered so many good artists. He, did a, he ended up doing a bunch of stuff, but Shipes was a promoter. And it was at a club in the city called Vela. And Vela was a restaurant that it had these ill tables that I'll never forget. It was like a regular restaurant. And then at 10 o'clock, they like hit this button and the tables went down to bottle service level. Mm. And then they turned it into a club. So this is AM era. AM is just coming out. I'm just hearing the AM mixes. And I'm like, how the fuck is he changing those songs so fast? Serato is just coming out. So like... Um, I started to kind of get an idea of like people playing Bon Jovi in the club, playing Prince in the club, because mm -hmm. that was a little out of my scope. I have older brothers and sisters that were right. kind of introducing me to new music, but it was more like freestyle and like 90s dance. Mm -hmm. And then my brother strangely had like a rock phase. So it was like Metallica and like that kind of stuff. Um, so I basically made a mixtape and I made... 10,000 copies of the mixtape. It's this red and white mixtape that I made in 05. And I would just give it out. I gave it out to every club. I would put it out on the tables. I put it on the bars. I'd give it, I just fucking went bananas. Right. Because um, Tape Masters Inc., we used to get mixtapes made. Mm. So I got them silk screened. They were color. They had the plastic case. They were like, they look, looked really nice. Mm -hmm. um, and the work came club started calling like right and then i had i like suddenly had all these residencies i was like playing like fancy clubs in new york like cane and like pink elephant and i was like this Jesus. dork from long island like i didn't fucking know my favorite i remember working at tenjun for the first time and the owner eugene god bless his soul he was like we have to talk about how you dress <laughs> like, what were you wearing with love <laughs> yeah with all of like love and constructive criticism but he was like we like let's fix this <laughs> what were you wearing what were you dressing yeah like? i should find like old there are some photos. really There's i'm some surprised really embarrassing pull photos some of these out. Like, on my like I, f I actually you know what i really should well, have first did? of all th was this the glasses era obviously yeah, i was blind i remember so, the glasses the glasses I was blind yeah, as a bat uh um, they were like this the square yep. the, the mm, rectangle, rectangle ones yeah, yeah. no good they, they were yeah. double. so i'm blind that's where i knew him from yeah. <laughs> you you kind of i feel like some of those old photos uh who was that who's that photographer you kind of looked like you were dressing like that really prominent photographer from like the new york scene back in the day who always wore those like graphic tees with, i like, had the well those it was long island and then there were Short these hair. like wow. there we go <laughs> That is rough. Oh, wow. damn. That was rough. I was, listen, I will, He looks way older there. Yeah, so he looks much, way older. He looks like an accountant. I will do Yo, can I say yeah. something? Save that picture. Yeah, we, like, we need that picture. I that, will do your taxes and do the No, club. no, no. That is 100% what an audio engineer would look like. Though. Yeah. All day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah. Like, that's what how when the audio engineer would look like. What frequency yeah. do you want me to edit out? Because that's the guy that will do that. Yeah, and he pushes <laughs> his glasses in the middle right before he chops something up. Bro, that was my move for years. The vast. After. Yeah. Yeah. Fast and tie oh. thing for when I yeah, that's the, those are the pictures I would see and I'm like this is the guy <laughs> doing we've come a long way Chachi <laughs> this no? is the guy burning the He's club like, what down? happened no, after I left it's not yeah. <laughs> after I got LASIK I had such muscle memory of pushing up my glasses that I used to do it when I didn't have glasses when did you yeah. get LASIK it was a uh, when I was thirty so like. 11 years ago. 11 years like, ago. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so you literally Im invaded the New York bottle service club scene 100%. through a mixtape. Through one mixtape. One mixtape. I just gave it out to fucking everybody. And Anyone like that would kind of listen. And I still get 
DMs and people are like, that one mixtape, it started with Bittersweet Symphony, I can't find it, and it's that one. Wow. Is it online? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I deck. think I uploaded all of my uh, old stuff onto my mix cloud. Oh. So th- this is like, were you influenced mainly from uh, DJ AM? I am, for sure. Yeah. I was like this, I was... So you weren't aware, you weren't going out in New York, you weren't listening to like all these other DJs like Goldfinger at Lotus or, like, no. or I even like, Riz or like uh, Eric LePoe or Reach. Mm-mm. None of these guys. Mm-mm. I didn't really get introduced to um, the rest of Nightlife till I started becoming a part of Nightlife. Right. Um, and then I didn't even really get um, used to Riz and Sizz and Scribble until I signed to Mood Swing because mm. then I was the young guy on the roster. Right. Like in, I mean, Scribble was the guy at uh, that time. That's why I always talk about this era as the DJ AM clone era because it was the first time I saw East Coast New York DJs sure. emulating a West Coast DJ. Yeah. And because the East Coast style was very much party rocking, it was smooth wasn't a lot of scratching because no one wanted the scratching Mm-mm. but i think tenjun because of mark mm-hmm. was mark the one who's a dj or eugene eugene right eugene like wanted he really yeah. loved djing he i mean loved he wasn't DJing. a dj but he just like kind of loved it he would jump on in but the middle of the I'm, night Taugu, when i say Taugu, i mean strategic group at the time but like agreed but yeah. they weren't even a group they had a club yeah, yeah. they only had marquee they had marquee mm-hmm. but and you know they were working with andrew sasson a lot at the mm-hmm. time mm-hmm. but yeah, like at that time, no one wanted scratching. So, yeah. but but Tenjun was the first venue that actually was embracing turntablism. Yeah, and then they were like, and like I, when I think of Tenjun, I think of like, wow, this was the club, and maybe stereo as well. Mm-hmm. That they were like, wow, they're letting the DJs just really go the fuck DJ. off and yeah. scratch. Yeah, mm-hmm. which was great, but also I was a little like, I can't believe everyone's trying to cop because everyone was just like. Getting work, copying AM routines. Yep. Right? For sure. That's crazy. Yeah. It was like, but it was like, for me, I would go back to New York in Vegas, and I'm like, why is everyone AM. DJing like AM? This yeah. isn't like New York anymore. Um, I feel like he was our first, like, you know, sort of celebrity. I didn't right. know what a celebrity was or a celebrity party. Like, my... My, I was so ignorant. I was so innocent. I knew nothing of nightclubs, nightlife. I didn't drink, like, yeah. nothing. I was not a nightlife person. I didn't go out. Like, I, I couldn't be any more removed from this scene and this community. So, being able to, like, connect with AM, I was sort of a battle DJ when I was young. I was very into scratching. Like, I, I loved it. And then being able to see him, like, be technical and play different kinds of music, mm-hmm. I was like enamored. So like replicating him or even kind of like kind of coming close, I was like, this is So he was your entry into it. like open I mean All we call that. it open format, but at the yeah. time maybe they were calling it like mashup DJ. Yeah. It was like definitely mashup yeah. DJ and like this was sort of like I was making mashups and then I would like chat with AM in the middle of the night, like on like AOL Instant Messenger and like when because when I found out he like played my stuff or liked my stuff, I was like Wait, what were some of your early mashups or mixes? He would low he would always play like that Billy Jean one that I made. It's Billy Jean and then that song Laid. Um mm-hmm. he would always play that. He used to play Tipsy Rent where I played it's like five hundred twenty five. Yeah. Oh yeah, I remember that one. Over the that was his thing, yeah. That was his thing. I made that as a joke for uh, this is girl. the time. This is the time when they were pu- putting tipsy drums on everything. 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 Yeah. Everything and anything. Yeah. And then I went to the lip gloss, uh, <laughs> the fucking drums. Yeah. So AM was just, uh, you know, for la- he was everything. So he reached us. out to you. He's like, "Yo, I like your shit." Or you? Well, reached out to him. I think what actually ended up really connecting us was Crooklyn Clan. So mm-hmm. I That's was true. the f- one of the first ten people to be on Crooklyn Clan's website yeah. at that time, and then all of these like this perfect storm of like i'm playing the right clubs in new york crooklyn clan comes ten june comes this manager that i was uh managing me at the time um gave me the opportunity to do murmur so i had an audition in atlantic city got that job so i'm now um the only 10 djs on crooklyn clan i'm playing the hottest club in new york city every thursday Mm -hmm. the hottest club in atlantic city and probably on the east coast at that time all of this, and then I meet Ricky Greenstein, um, and then I'm signed to Mood Swing. It's like, like this whole yeah, thing happened fast, 
Right. So I have oh. like this list of residencies that I have in like 2011 and it is thick because every other market in the country was like, you're the number one here. You're number one here. You know, they were like, come on in. Wow. Whatever money you want. It was like, it was bread plus flights plus hotels. Yeah, yeah. I had like 17 residencies at that time. I was on the road yeah. and I was a, a kid. I still lived home. That's I had insane. nothing. So you were just saving all this money. So like full circle back to like my investment. I'm living home. I have no bills. I have no time to spend the money because I'm gigging so much. So wow. I was just like, and my, my father's like, yeah, that's nice. You made money. Give, give me, give me that. Put it away. Put it away. Mm -hmm. Put it. He like, didn't even give me an opportunity to spend it. The only thing I ever bought was a car. And I went to the, it was when the poor man's Bentley came out. I went to the Chrysler the dealership. Chrysler, yeah, the 300, boy. Yeah. I slapped a check for $32,000 on the desk and I was like, see ya. And I walked out. That was the only thing I ever bought. Wow. So <laughs> then what, how did the, the Shrine opportunity come to you? So <coughs> Ricky Greenstein um, was my manager at that time. Mm -hmm. And his brother, Randy Greenstein, uh, is one of the owners of um, Big Night. A big night in Boston. Mm -hmm. Shrine was their second club, I think. Their first club was the estate, which is no longer around. I think the college bought that land. But they told me of this opportunity that they were going to open up a club in Foxwoods. They explained all the um, details that go along with it. Wait, and Foxwoods is like what? Is it the biggest casino in, in, the, in America? I think it's in, in the world. In the world. Yeah. Damn. Just uh, in pure, Connecticut. pure square footage. Yeah. It's it's a, a city. huge yeah it's a city in mm -hmm. itself and they were basically like you know we're going to be the only nightclub within i don't know how many hundreds of miles they have a huge um amphitheater there that they're going to be doing x amount of shows every weekend they would just basically explain the foot traffic and i was like oh okay i was like here's you know one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. let me know what's up well also <laughs> I mean, I would imagine Ricky knew how much money you were making, sure. so they knew yeah. you could. Well, and also I was like, and I'm literally. So they, they brought this to you. They're like, there's this opportunity. Yeah. So wow. uh, me and some other DJs as we chatted yeah. before, but I was already, I was already planning to retire at 25 because I was like, why? I was just basically like, how long can I actually do this? Is this like a real viable? Was that like, your, was that like kind of uh, like your parents kind of reminding you that there was like a shelf life to DJ? It's possible, yeah. Right? Or it could have just been my foresight to like always have multiple pokers in the fire. Like you never know, one goes out. I want to have multiple revenue streams, et cetera, et cetera. Also, was there, I'm just curious about this now, like was there anybody at the time who was 10, 15 years older than you that was. That was my this? question. That was going right? to be my question. Absolutely right. not. Everybody ahead of me. I was basically a collector of things that I didn't want to do. So I would watch older DJs and their bad habits. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would say, okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go down that. Okay. For example, like that. let me hear. <laughs> like, yeah. You don't Just, have to say the names, but yeah. Yeah. But like, it's like we live and worked in an environment where we had every vice mm -hmm. for free. Yeah. Yeah. If it was booze, if it was women, um, drugs. If it was drugs, if it, whatever it was, like it was, here you go. And yeah. it's free and it's like unlimited. So yeah. you could make mistakes very quickly, whether it was, you know, lots, lots of options. So, uh, I was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to spread my money. Da, 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 da. So I was just like, you know, I was already planning my retirement. It was wild. So when, when you were coming up, were your parents supportive? No. <laughs> they still don't know what he does. They don't know. <laughs> no. They've no. never seen you? But they, they're proud, I, I think. I swear to God, my... Uh, they always thought you were crazy. They're like, what are you doing? They were like, get a real job. Yeah. Like your whole family kind of... They still don't really kind of know. Like, and, and we're doing such, you know, I'm like consulting for like these multi-billion dollar national hospitality groups. And they're like... What do you what what <laughs> sounds yeah. cool? You know, like <laughs> they're like you making money. You good? You good? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I'm nice like house. I'm like everything is great. But like my even my parents, I finally brought them to Shrine. So I had invested in Shrine. Shrine was like twelve million to build, and I was like, right, I'm doing I'm doing good. My mother was like, 
It's just different. It's nice. Different. Yeah. yeah. If I was a if I was like a lawyer, doctor, or accountant making less money, they probably would have been like, mm-hmm. Scotty's doing really because that's well. a, a feasible uh, concept to them. It's concrete. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's concrete. What it are you sense. Italian or what are you? Yeah. Hundred percent. Are you first generation? Uh, no, my parents were born here. Oh, they were born here. Yeah, okay, because yeah. usually first generation, even second, they're like they still don't understand. You know, I understand it. It's it. the instability of you know every week not knowing exactly how much you're going to make. Mm-hmm. It's like, yep. but there's also no ceiling to that. Mm-hmm. But you oh. also, yeah, you're also the product of a generation. I think your generation, a little bit of mine. Maybe I'm I'm the one of the first, but like the concept of like it of not going to college and getting a regular job. So yep. we kind of broke that rule. Yeah. Where we were actually like, for us to like, I always say this on the podcast, like for us to just make money doing what we love was like, we, we didn't think that was possible. It was either, you know? it was either weird or wrong. Yeah. Like you, you have to like, cause there was work, no blueprint. Right. Right. Work <coughs> was work. So right. like work was not like, not happy you know you're not supposed to like enjoy your job it's like hard work you know like it doesn't always have to be hard work so like bless my father my mom said no (laughs) and my father was like you have to let him try and see what's up like if he fails you know we'll cross that bridge when we get there interesting so like all the investing your your father was kind of like alongside of you i mean like you know you got to do something with this money he he (sighs) yes and no he was like the most financial conservative man ever like he was just like you know what do you do for a living my father ran a an auto repair shop in jamaica queens so i grew up at the shop Mm -hmm. Uh, all the boys in my family started working at the shop when we were eight so um summer vacations we didn't have summer vacations we went to the shop yeah and you know when we were really young like eight we would work these half days but um when i was like 10 or 11 we'd we were doing 12 hour days in my dad's shop. I'm like in, in the bays, like changing alternators and doing breaks and yeah. like all this shit. Um, we learned what hard work was probably during your era was kind of like maybe, and I could be wrong, but I feel like there was also a lot of nepotism going on where there was a lot of rich kids that were just getting put on there. And, and you know what I mean? There's that share of that in New York. And, it, and you were like very the opposite of that. Oh yeah, we were the you know what I'm most saying? blue collar, mm-hmm. right? So, know. but but when you're surrounded by all of these kids that have the freedom yeah. to do whatever they want and yeah. fail, and but still have you know a backup plan, have a backup mm-hmm. plan for the family and everything. Yeah, I feel like you were also just kind of like I'm. I, I'm not like these kids. I gotta really. I wasn't. I'm still. I really gotta save my money and do something with it. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's definitely where all that came from. But my father was just, he was a good businessman. He always really understood his investments and he was a, he was a planner. Yeah. He was constantly, and like, I guess that filtrated into me because I was 25 planning my retirement. Who, who did you identify with during that scene in New York? Like who were your peers at that time? I mean. I know M- I mentioned Sean Perry, right? Sean Perry was around, MOS, yeah. Barry, um, Jesse Marco was around. Jesse Marco was around. Sus one, who I randomly Sus one, yeah, yeah. Sus, I randomly yeah. went to college with Sus. Really? Yeah, yeah, we were both at Five Towns together, but then we didn't like we weren't friends at that time because Sus was cool and I was not. Yeah, and um, we see how you dress, so yeah, <laughs> an odd couple. <laughs> yeah, it only got worse when I started working with Tate Masters Inc. because then I started to sort of like adopt some hip hop culture, and it yeah. was whew, awful. It was so bad. It got way worse. We can look at those pictures. <laughs> Can't wait. Well, Blow I'll send you guys. I have like this hilarious picture. It's me DJing at stereo. I have like this low Yankees fitted um, and this like Crooks and Castles shirt. It's like street culture was like kind of yeah, like yeah, really it's like 05, 06. <sighs> it's or or I have like um, I'm actually I think it's a picture with Just Blaze at stereo. I'm on my sidekick. I have a bape something either bape or whatever or like an ed hardy i was like it's so, there's too many brands going on what was your favorite club at the time when you were spinning there i remember like uh before i went to vegas i had a residency at kane mm-hmm. uh i was a pm mm-hmm. uh, it was a one on sundays sure uh like it's when the meat packing was kind of um, like it was kind everything. Of bubbling i was yeah. i think i was doing lotus nice and i think sean perry was on to come up with me mm-hmm and then I, you know, they were like, when I was leaving for Vegas, they were like, you know, what, you know, what are we going to do to cover your nights? And I was like, you know, Sean, Sean Perry can do Hold it. Hold it down. So he actually like 
adopted some of my residencies at the time. And nice. That was when I left. That's when you started emerging mm -hmm. and all these other dudes. And Stereo opened for the first time. Yeah. And I remember going to Stereo and I was like, this is a club? Because it didn't seem, it they seemed were. like someone just opened some shit. <laughs> and you know what I mean? And just like, because I was like, this is like, this doesn't even seem like a they club. They were like um, ultra lounges, yeah, I yeah. guess, for like a better term. But, but that it, was around this time, there was like all these clubs that people were just opening. Mm -hmm. But they, they, you could just tell they weren't really clubs. <laughs> and they would call it an ultra lounge or an, uh, like a high energy <laughs> lounge. I forgot what they were calling it at the time. Ultra lounge, I think it was like the big... Term that sounds like, like it. That. Yeah, I don't it even like ultra lounge. I don't remember if that term because they didn't have like uh, they didn't have a cabaret license. Ah, so you couldn't uh, dance in these clubs. Yeah, yeah. So you couldn't so call it tables. a nightclub. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, So I, I mean, this is the time when even PM didn't even have a uh uh. This that was uh, unique and Kiki. They didn't have a cabaret license. Right. So they would have like a red light under the DJ booth. In the case cop, the cops were coming, yeah. they would get yeah. noise complaints, and then there couldn't be anyone dancing. Right. That's so we'd have to shut off the music. But all of these spots never had. A cabaret license. Right. So was, I think that was the ultra lounge. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. It was a really interesting time in nightlife because bottle service was really new. Mm -hmm. um, and per, I mean, personally, Tenjun was my club. Like the way that. It wasn't new, but it was getting. It was five years old at the time or something like that. It was just really getting manufactured. It was just really getting manufactured. <laughs> like everyone's like, oh my God. Yeah, we, we don't need to sell home, entry, yeah. like entry tickets yeah. to yep. get in. There's no admission. Right. We're better off like having people spend four or five hundred mm. instead of like twenty fifty dollars to get in. Yeah, like my you know Long Island friends, they would like come to work or come to my clubs and like they wouldn't let them in. And they were like, "What do you mean we like just can't go in? Like we can't buy a ticket? We can't?" Do this. Yeah, they were like. Pfft. And then I would come up in like <laughs> flip flops. <laughs> no and, way. Yeah, I would. My my whole thing in New York during the two thousands when I was like fucking DJing everywhere. And I knew security everywhere. Like right. we're like DJs, we're always cool with security everywhere. Everywhere. That's probably the first friends we make is like Yeah, security. you have to. Because they're listening and they're, they're just like, Oh man, when you drop that Jada kiss or whatever <laughs> you know, and they'd be like Knock Yo, yourself yeah, out because yeah. that was the joint. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Yeah. So they'd be like, you know, and at the end of the night you would play for the security a little bit. Yeah, you have to as a staff. Yeah. But like, yo, like I would walk in, I would try I would roll out of bed. And I just be like, yeah, let me go to, you know, Stop by. Marquee or like, Pull. let me go to a bed or something or mm -hmm. home. Pull. And they would just let me in. You were like the DJ Mark Zuckerberg. I would, <laughs> I'd be in like this old <laughs> shitty t-shirt. Like jeans, sweats with stains. Like, I would intentionally wear flip flops. That is so, oh, everyone's standing in that Mark's line. Ugh. And then everyone would be like, what the fuck are you letting in? <laughs> and this is Serato, is it still vinyl? Uh, this is, uh, it has to be Serato. Uh, no, it's a I'm sorry. Vinyl. This is ballpark. <laughs> CDJs. Oh. No, Tenjun was Serato. I remember Tenjun. This being is like two thousand three. But I mean, oh, pre Serato. SL yeah. Box One, like this. But like, listen, if you knew the doorman and you knew security, you got in. That was it. High five. I'm in. Hello. Jesus. Yeah. Same it way would it is always today. Piss everyone off. <laughs> yeah, especially girls wearing heels. Like, oof. I mean, the dudes would just be like, "What the fuck? <laughs> yeah, are you letting this person?" But go? also that era, there were a lot of clubs. Like, if you went to 27th Street, you stopped by six spots on Jesus. the block. They would block off the street. They would have the cops on horses, um, and like those big goofy spotlights, and no, there was no traffic. You could go to Kane, Susie Wong's, Pink Elephant, like, Bed, home and guest. Yeah. yeah. Bed was on, like, 21st or something like that. Home, like... Yeah, Home and Guest yeah. House. I was, yeah. like, the gas lamp this year. Yeah, just yeah. jam-packed. It was literally, mm -hmm. like, that era was, like, pre... Um, well, maybe around the meatpacking time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was, Meat like, two districts, the 27th Street, and yep. it was meatpacking. You had Lotus... You had APT, yep. you had Cielo. Oh APT Mondays? Yeah. That, who was Cielo. that, Primo? Did Premier do APT Mondays? I remember AM did, a, did an APT Monday. I mean, it was like, that's like Rich Medina. Damn. That's a whole That was era. a good era. Yeah, that was yeah. a great era. And then there's Cielo, had mm -hmm. an amazing system. Then you had PM, and yep. then you had one and a couple of other spots around mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's different eras. Like in the early 2000s, there was like the Lafayette Street era. Mm -hmm. Which is like Pangea, Joe's Pub, yep, and all, and uh, time, a little bit before Time Cafe, yeah, I think, a little bit was like popping yeah. back then with rehab. Um, yeah, yeah. So twenty seven, that was your era. I remember pretty much. Wait, wait. So which one was your favorite? Where you where you thought you were just killing it, and you just knew the room for sure. Tenjun, 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 right? for sure. The way that room was situated because the of the sunken dance floor, <coughs> the surrounding tables, there was like this 
channel of energy to the DJ booth. Let's talk about Tenjun for a little bit. Well, I'm, I'm, because what, like, what everyone talks about Marquee or like these other club eras, but sure. like no one really talks really about Tenjun and what it was kind of offering at that time. I think in, so, your, in your perspective, Tenjun was I think it was just the perfect storm of like certain clubs closed, certain clubs kind of faded. Twenty Seventh Street was kind of like getting phased out. Yeah, get not getting either getting not getting phased out, but just like it was had been around for a little while, so like you know it wasn't so shiny. Yeah, because I remember I was also DJing at Quo. Yeah, Twenty Eighth Street. Yeah, that's right around the corner. So yep. Quo was like a huge club. Yeah, Twenty. But that was probably ten. It probably closed around that time. Quo was like yeah, was um, closing. It was just. Marquee wasn't as like popping as it had been, mm -hmm. and Mark and Eugene were actually promoters. Um, uh, Mark was a promoter at Air, which was turned into Kiss and Fly, uh, um, okay. which turned into VIP Club. And then Eugene, I always forget who he worked for. Um, who owned um, Casamigos with George Clooney? Gerber. Oh, Guy Gerber. Yeah. So Eugene was working for the Gerber Group uh, as a promoter. So they were just promoters. And they had found a financial backer and they opened up a nightclub. Mm. And that was like... The what year was this? Uh, I have to find out the real year, but I think it's like 07. Oh, okay. And this is the time when you guys like... When every DJ in New York, they were like working with PR agencies. That's just fascinating. To me. I hadn't had one yet. I didn't get PR until I was with Mood Swing, which was just like the weirdest. But thing. I've never heard of it because it was DJs paying five hundred to like a thousand dollars a month. It was expensive mm -hmm. just yeah. to get mentions in like page six. You said and stuff like that. page six yeah. in like People magazine because everyone would want it to be like AM. So oh, they so wanted to. They wanted like AM was like that. He was, basically he was a an open format hip hop mashup DJ, but he was one of us. He was just a club DJ. Sure. Mm -hmm. But he, you know, dated Nicole Richie and started to be doing all these celebrity parties. Yeah. And then he was getting all these mentions, and we're and and all these other DJs in New York were like, we want that page six mention in New York Post. Yep. We like if um, you know any of these LA uh, Hollywood types were partying in New York, we want that mention of like, you know, Paris mm -hmm. Hilton was at. This club and Chachi or somebody was DJing. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's just one of those things that you could put on your MySpace, yeah. you could clip it. That's so right? crazy. That's on what I was MySpace, saying. Yeah. I should have logged into my MySpace. Um, but I have all these old clips of like People Magazine, OK Magazine. I was in, you know, like um, okay, they don't have, uh, yeah. they don't have them anymore. But like you know, the Delta used to get on the plane and used to have like that. The magazines. Little, I was in that in 09 when live opened and i don't know how i got it but it was like uh they did a miami spread and it was like oh you have to go to live in miami you could hear the likes of tiesto and chachi and i was right. like how the fuck that's some fuck juice the, buddy the fuck am i doing and i was like tiesto and chachi <laughs> i was like hello and hello i was like this doesn't make any sense but it must have been like my pr team yeah, yeah. They were with no retirement, boy. Wow. Like my, PR got, my, PR my PR team. My PR team. I got that team. screenshot if you need it. <laughs> yeah, send it to me. Chachi. They earned that monthly, monthly retainer. That month. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, what was your retainer? What were you paying? It was bread. It was like 1500 a month. 1500 a month. Back then. Well, it was worth it, though. Yeah, it seems like. I mean, bro, he got a fucking... I don't know if it... Delta mag. But yeah. I don't know if it... I don't know if there was an actual return on the investment. Like, when did you start hearing about it? Who was the first DJs that told you, like, yo, you got to get a PR? Like, oh, that was Mood Swing, for sure. Mood Swing. For sure, yeah. I didn't really learn about the business until I really met them. Before before then, I was just like, I'm going to play music and you're going to give me money. Right. Like, okay. It was just almost <laughs> like uh, like the right time, right place. All day. The, like these clubs were just looking for DJs and talented DJs. All day. And yeah. not everyone understood Serato, no. right? Not everyone was on that yet. Serato, um, sound, how to work a crowd, how yeah. to like when to scratch, when and not And also to it was like the emergence of Electro- and oh, all that, that shit, crazy. and yeah. a lot of these older DJs weren't on that electro shit. Blog you know? house, yeah, blog house. You know, like oh Nostradamus and Diplo had like just like just just sell it. I remember, yeah, I remember because like, these DJs that were like kind of the OGs, they were still holding on to like the old rock sets. Yeah, and they and then I was actually fortunate because like when I came up in New York, I was one of the first hip hop DJs to do house rooms, so I could do house and hip hop. Mm -hmm. And so I was doing like house and hip hop, house and hip hop with rock, and then right. I would do everything. Right. But like not a, like if you were a hip hop DJ, you were just a hip hop DJ. Yeah. So you might have known some like break beats, classics, and then some rock. 
Right. But you didn't know about like the strokes. We tried. Or, like some of yeah. some of the newer shit, you know, you didn't know about Jet or like Right. We tried you know? to like incorporate some of those hip hop DJs into Tenjun and they would flop. Yeah. Because they mm. weren't Because they weren't versatile. up on ju- justice and all this other shit that was coming up. They weren't you know? versatile enough. Yeah. Which is okay because they were a hip hop guy and like if I went to their room, I would probably not be great. Right. But Tenjun was this mishmash of like blog house and electro and like you know some of getas like early really early stuff yeah. and then but a little bit of hip-hop like but how to put all that together into like a flow and like yeah. work the energy was like something they weren't yeah because when i was djing it was like oh shit this dude's playing paul johnson get down yep and he's playing bob sinclair yeah and then he's playing hip-hop like mm-hmm. and dance hall and then all this other shit right they didn't want much dance hall at that time no no, no but you know, like you had all of this house shit that these hip hop rock DJs they they didn't understand. They, yeah, they weren't fucking with. And the uh, the indie stuff, which was huge, indie right? Space. Like in the it was like Calvin Harris had like just came out with like that remix of Great DJ, the mm-hmm. Ting Tings. Um, we that's actually where my mixtape series comes from. Right. So the first part of Ten June would be like all of this indie shit that was like I was like searching blogs like all night. Yeah, I would listen to your mixtapes and I'd be like, oh shit, I don't have this. I don't I don't know this remix. Yeah, so yeah. that's where that came from. Eugene actually came up with it. He's like, Split Tenjun is literally like two different nightclubs. He's like, the first half of the night until like it's like ready to pop is like this indie stuff, electro stuff. He's like, and then we do house and hip hop. And that's where the mixtape series come from. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Eugene's been a really big part of my life he's been a mentor for a really long time he is one of my guys that i call for advice to this day him um i mean he's one of the owners of catch you know they've expanded for they have so many locations now yeah yeah but um i got really lucky with mentorship ricky greenstein's brother randy who owns big night i mean they have countless venues in boston they run massachusetts um he became a really big mentor of me with business, Eugene. It's just, I've been really lucky with that. So like around this time, as you're like navigating your career, you're, you're killing it in New York. And then I, I was like, we were talking about this a little bit, but it was like around 2013 to 15, I would come back to visit New York mm-hmm. and I'd be like, wow, like there was a change. Cause we I would, were, I, we were I, late. I, I would come back to New York like in the late 2000s. Yeah. And I'd be like, man, New York's kind of killing it. You know, they, they're like right on time with shit. Um, and then around 2013, I'd come back and I'd be like, what are they playing? Like, <laughs> they're still playing like, you know, Jay-Z PSA. They're still playing like all this old shit. Because mm-hmm. the hip hop, there was no presence of like New York hip hop really. Like, I mean, you hip-hop know? wasn't a struggle around that time. You're talking about dance music, EDM at its peak. Yeah, and, and no everyone, like, EDM was everywhere, EDM remixes. All I, have the, a, you know? I have a different theory, actually. Go ahead. I think it um, it wasn't, it, did, it had much less to do with the music itself. Mm-hmm. And I think it had much more to do with nightclubs um, navigating playing hip-hop and then um, not bringing a crowd that they weren't really looking for. Spending crowd. Well, it's like bottle service crowds, but they wanted hip hop, but like they didn't want to become like an urban night. They were like, but that's always been a factor with any night night. Yeah, a hundred percent. The only thing is, in the two thousands, I feel like the late nineties and the two thousands, there was this this uh, there was this merging of worlds Mm -hmm. of like hip hop, fashion, and like rich white people. Like, (laughs) like it was just really like where you saw like. Rockefeller, you saw Dame Dash with Aaliyah mm-hmm. and with like Victoria's Secret models. Right. And it was insane. I remember there was a club called Park. Like, and it was like Mark Ronson was DJing. Mm-hmm. So you had like all of these like new kind of like white boy DJs that knew how to play hip hop, but they were like inserting all this like cool rock indie shit. And yeah. it was like these two worlds were colliding. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I think as time went on and EDM started blowing up, I think everyone was following Vegas. So like yeah. I would yeah, come back to New York and I'd be like, wait, what happened to New York? New York, uh, New York sounds like Vegas, mm-hmm. and there, everyone's doing an imitation of Vegas because they're like, yeah, everyone wants to experience that Vegas like mm-hmm. energy, the room, the big room factor, you know, the build up songs, like they they wanted yeah. that shit, and then the hip hop kind of died, and it was I think, that, but I also think New York like the hip hop just wasn't hitting. There was no artists 
After French Montana and like Bobby Shmurda went to jail and shit. Well, this is even this. This <laughs> that's is before late. though. That's later. Yeah, that's yeah, later. That's later. We talking about before? Yeah, in 2010. Yeah. No, I'm talking about 2013. No, uh, that's right. Like 2010 to like 14. Yeah. LA was in the same place. We're in the same predicament. No, no, I feel like LA was killing it with mustard. You guys had not, like not yet. Not yet. That's 14. 14. Well, 15, well yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like 13, 2013. No, no, you're right. That LA had a problem. We had a problem with hip hop. You guys were on the EDM road because everywhere I went, everyone was trying to sound like a Vegas mm -hmm. yes Vegas Playhouse yeah. on a Saturday which that's where I heard Chachi for the first time it was big room EDM it was this big dance thing yeah and then on on Fridays and Thursdays you'll get some hip hop DJs but they still had to put the EDM factor because they wanted to sell tables right so then around 2000 oh well, yeah 2014 that's when mustard that's a, took all over. this like yeah. hip hop from the west coast but like you know and then down south was killing it new york you know? actually did had a very specific era where they suddenly almost over uh corrected and they would have nights of um they would be like you can only play hip hop yeah the door was like super tight so the crowd was like great but they were like you can only play hip hop and we were like whoa like this overcorrection, and then this mi like they were micromanaging us like the managers of the nightclubs like that era kind of came in what, what, it, what was that around similar i'm gonna say 13 14 15, 13 14 yeah, because, because I remember, they, they thought that the edm shit was just taking it was just everywhere. they thought it was either over or like that bubble had burst or their clientele like was or they had pockets of clientele that were like we were we've had enough of that we want some hip-hop yeah and it was you know, um, clients that could spend a lot of money, but they the clubs were like super annoying. Like it was like to the point where I was like, I don't want to DJ anymore. Like leave me alone. I know how to do this. I know how to run a room. Like if I'm not playing a hundred percent hip hop, like they were like so far up your ass. Did you feel a need to like, happen. you know, like to be like I have to become an EDM DJ now? For yeah. sure. Yeah, I went through that when I had um, I had left Mood Swing at one point. I forget the year. And I signed to this other label called Stadium Red, and I was like, "You left Mood Swing." Yeah, I left why did Mood you leave Mood Swing? Um, I felt like I had like plateaued, and I wasn't continuing to grow, and I felt like I was just doing the same clubs and the same you know crap over and over. Right. Um, what did you want more? You wanted to do like festivals and <coughs> yeah, I wanted to move up, and I was like, the only way I'm going to do it is if I do dance music. Um, so, but what, what what planted that seed? Because there's all these DJs from around your era that felt like they I need to become a festival DJ. It was it could be social media because I don't really know what was big at that point. If it was like Facebook or I don't. I don't what know. year was this? Fourteen. Oh, Probably Instagram. 14, 15, and 14. it was Instagram. Instagram. It was takes, Instagram. Uh, so it, sorry, not it's, it's also it's also the time when I started noticing like hip-hop mashup open format djs completely switching to cdjs and they stopped they abandoned turntables and they were they were trying to adopt cdjs mm -hmm. because they thought that's what edm big edm yes. DJs do sure and they yeah. have four decks cdj decks only using two yeah two, one that they use to hold their drink and yeah one <laughs> to charge their phone on the other one mm -hmm. That's what happens. But I was just like looking at these DJs like, why are y'all doing the CDJ shit? Yeah. Y'all don't sound as good. You see, I always thought it was clean. the venues trying to... No, no, no. The risk factor it was of, some of the, of bigger the turntable DJs. not working. It was some of the bigger DJs saying like, oh, like, you know, like I, I knew it was basically optics. Yeah. yeah. I felt like... They, I think it was optics. <laughs> maybe it was other reasons you may be that right. they yeah. told me, but I, I think it was optics. I think... Um, so you have to remember by... 2013 or whatever i had already been traveling internationally yeah so i had played almost every major market in the united states i had been to asia multiple times mm -hmm. i played in poland by that time i played in spain i had done a lot as an open format dj so i basically was like i think i've done all i can do as this version of myself um you and you burnt only, out for sure bored um, complacent a little a hundred percent probably bored yeah, because it's like once you do some really cool shit and then you come back to your normal stuff you're like you caught the bug this is but it's also a mix of that and social media because you, you, you come back and you see someone else doing something yeah and bigger the, and better and then right in combination with those two things 
the guy that I signed to, Stadium Red, I think also placed that bug. So it was like I was being manipulated by my new management to think that EDM was the only way for me to really like break through this glass ceiling. Right. I was a little burnt from traveling because I was literally on the road 52 weeks out of the year. I would used to, I remember DJing Christmas Eve every year. Like that's how much I was I was gigging. Right. Um, and then having done all of that cool shit and actually seeing the road, seeing the world, I was like, how do I keep going? How do I keep evolving? And I thought EDM was the way. Right. When you look back, do you think that was the right move? I think it could have been the right move. Could have. I think if I really would have like planted my flag, stuck my feet in the sand and kind of ate shit for a little while because that's really what I had to do. Mm-hmm. I thought it was going to be a much easier transition and it was not. <laughs> it was not. Um, wait, wait, what was some of the obstacles you were facing? I was a, a extremely successful open format DJ for over a decade at this yeah. point. People were like, we know you as A, we want you to DJ as A. Yeah. So if I would have really been like, this is this is the way that I go, which <laughs> I have a great example of somebody that did do that and yeah. is really successful is yeah. Barry. Mm-hmm. Barry hated open format DJing. Um, he loved house. He stuck his feet in the sand. He planted his flag, and he's still touring. He's killing it. He's been on tour with Jamie Jones for a really, really long time. So, in your opinion, uh, if you could go back mm-hmm. and and do it all over again, would you have tried, or would you have stayed? I think kind of an open format DJ. I. Th- I think I could have actually been more successful both ways. So if I would have just stayed in open format DJ, yeah. I think I would have been more successful than I am now. And yeah. then I also think if I leaned into EDM and really went for it, I think I'd also be successful in that. Hmm. As opposed to like kind yeah. of straddling the right. two worlds. One foot in, one foot out, kind of fucked me. Mm. So I'm kind of curious, like when you had a meeting with your new management, mm-hmm. like what was the rebranding what was their formula? Um, I don't think there was that much of a formula. But what was your formula? Knowing that they were they were saying that you had to become an EDM DJ. And then what was part of the formula or the, the I would strategy? say the driving force and the strategy was making music. So I like leaned into the studio. I was producing Stadium Red, had a studio in Harlem. And you were doing everything? Every, I was doing everything on my own. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had a studio in Harlem called Stadium Red Studios. Just Blaze worked out of there. They had like huge um, mixing and mastering engineers, tons of like, we had like. So did you stop gigging as much and you said, let me yep. double down and yep. that, and that, that, did that also create a problem because other people took some of your residencies? For sure. Yeah. I mean, event, like throughout my career, like Murmur was like a really good one where like I was doing Fridays, Saturdays and Mondays. Then I was like, all right, let me only do Fridays and Saturdays. And then I gave PS1 Mondays mm-hmm. at Murmur. Then I was like, okay. Let me only do Saturdays or something like that. So slowly but surely, I would be uh, like, I think I gave like Doug Grayson Fridays or something. Doug Grayson, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've heard that in a minute. (laughs) Um, And so like slowly, I would be like, okay, boop, you know, I'm going to do this. Here's this. And then I would move on. Um, You know. And then then did you always think this is always going to be here for me? So I got to try this other thing. I don't think I ever felt like that. No. Like. DJing is something, and I still feel like this, the uncertainty of what we do, like, haunts me. That really? I don't know how much money I'm going to make every week. And it's not this rock, you know, stability, like, that kind of thing. Wow, to this day, you feel like that. Yeah. Why, you don't feel like that? At no, all? I feel like that, but <laughs> he's been doing it a 10 day, uh, sorry, a 10 years plus. I would feel he has some type of stability to this I, at this point. And the funny thing is I do. And I have more stability now than I have ever had. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it's still not a nine to five. My check is X every week. Like, that's not. And what's crazy about that too is you definitely earn so much more (laughs) than the majority of people who have that stability, but it's that kind of psychological trick. Yeah. It's like people that, um, if they like grew up extremely low income, like that, um, like thought process and like that place where they operate from scarcity never set never goes away. Well, do you always, do you feel like an imposter syndrome where like, I don't really fit in this world? Absolutely. My whole life. I was like, what the, I'm, I'm 20, Five. I'm DJing Britney Spears' birthday party. I'm like, I'm on like, um, what was that show at the time? It was like ET. Mm-hmm. I'm on ET. I'm like, what the fuck am I doing here? Like, 
I have these moments in my life. I'm, I'm, I can literally remember I'm at One Oak. One Oak is not open yet. It is the friends and family uh, night. And I'm on my sidekick scrolling like AIM back then. Mm-hmm. The sidekick is, by the way, like the supporting <sighs> the, role of this sidekick. journey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I had that fucking... It's your therapist. Fucking, we all had it. Yeah. Yeah. The black and silver. Iconic. Black and black. Yes. And I hear Richie Akiva talking to somebody and I'm like, I fucking know that voice. And I look up and it's Jay-Z. And I'm like... Okay, I'm just gonna fucking pass. <laughs> You're like, at any point, they're gonna kick me out this room. Let me just fucking pass out while Jay Z and Beyonce are fucking sitting at this table watching me DJ. And I'm like, who? What? What? So you always yeah. were like, I, I, sh- I don't deserve to be here. I should not be here. Or were you ever like just fully in it and being like, I've made it. This is where I, I this is where I am. I don't, I don't belong. Like yeah, yeah. my whole life, I don't belong. I'm not a nightlife person. I don't do drugs. I barely drank. I only started drinking alcohol when I met Vice. That was the first time I drank tequila. Yeah. Vice came to Murmur, and he was like, "Was it class?" I think Vice did that to a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> was, it, was, it, was it class or soup? No, it was back when Patron was. Patron. Cool. So um, horrible. I hate the fucking Patron era. It was the fucking. It was oof. the worst because then. At that point, I'm on the road more than ever, and then I have this drinking reputation. So because then when of I, vice. Because of vice. And nice. then I go to these other cities, and now I'm sh- I was shit faced for like 15 years. Got to do Jesus. shots with the manager. Got to shots with everybody. Yeah. People are like what? This is what you do. You and I'm fucking. You know, I'm like 150 pounds soaking wet, like getting wrecked and trying to DJ. So wait, were you a different person when you drank? No. No. Same guy. Really? Same, guy, same dork. Are you the type of dude that when you when you drink, I can't tell if you're sober or drunk? Oh, God. So the only way you can tell if I'm drunk is if you talk to me. Because my DJing was fucking locked in right. muscle memory that if you listen to my sets, you had no idea. I finished DJing and I'm like, huh. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> fucking So we do it after, guys. That's all because of what, what did what advice introduce you to? He like, was just it, basically like, this is what we do. DJs drink. We get shit faced at work. Yeah. Like, you know, that was that era. And so you're like, I got to be a part of this I was a like, little bit. Yeah. I was it's like, like the personality. Yeah. Like, I was like, oh. Or did you have a great night and you were like, oh my God, I want another great night like this? No. No. I was like, this is what we do. I DJs get drunk. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't know the rules. I didn't know anything. Right. I knew nothing. I, was I had not the same anxiety person. when I first started DJing, Kirk. I was like, damn, I have to drink. I have to be this this personality in the booth. There's yeah. that. Till I met Rockticon, and he was like, you don't have to do any of that. Oh, I, miss already, An- I miss Andy, bro. Because he he's, 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 he's such a sober person. And then I was like, oh, I found like a, a, a like a home with him where I'd be like, oh, I can just, I don't have, I could say no to drinks. He, I think, was the first DJ that was like, I don't give a fuck what you want me to do, what you want me to be. This is who I am. Yes. This is how I play. This is how I play. Right. Like me or fuck off. And I was like, wow. Mm-hmm. Because I think my imposter syndrome and all that was, I was constantly in this like people pleasing thing where I was like, oh, you want me to get drunk? I don't know, let's get drunk. Oh, you want me to play like more house music? Oh, fuck, like here we go. Like this is what this is what we do. Rockticon was also like during that era, like it was like Mark Ronson was like the biggest shit in New York. Mm-hmm. And I mean before that it was Stretch Armstrong, right? Yep. And it was like Mark Ronson and then there was an AM. There was DJ AM. Mm-hmm. And then after AM it was like Rockticon's the next one up. He was disgusted. Right. So he, like it was just like Rathacon is the next one up. So it just mm-hmm. seemed natural that everyone was like, "Who's going to be after Rathacon?" Mm-hmm. So there was this probably your generation was like, "I'm going to be the next dude after Rath." Like I want to be after Rathacon. We were like coming up in a similar sense, but I think um, I was a little bit more flexible mm-hmm. than Rathacon, and I think Rathacon just like rubbed people the wrong way. Right. And I was like, I'll literally do a backflip right now. You want me to do cartwheels while I DJ? I was like, that's fine. Like, whatever you want me to do. But, like, like a company man. Yeah. I was a people pleaser yeah. because mm-hmm. I was like, I don't belong here, so I must probably have to do whatever I have to do to stay in the room. To stay here. Work harder, yes. molds. Yourself. But I will always attest, like, me not being a nightlife person and, like, not being a party boy, like, not doing drugs, like, not fucking around gave me staying power because I treated it like a business. Yeah. I treated it like work. I was like, when people would fuck around or I would bring friends, like I would bring friends to Atlantic City all the time. And if they fucked around and like got drunk, got in trouble, whatever, they were fucking cut. 
Yeah, yeah. wouldn't bring them again. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> yeah. Remember? You, you I, are who you keep? Yeah, I, I brought homies along and Korea's like, don't do that. Yeah. And then I, the homies came through it and then I was like, oh, worst decision. You the world. are who you keep. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I actually got banned from Borgata. Uh, so did Barry. Yeah. Barry, yeah. Barry, yeah. Barry got banned because one of his friends had coke. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I got I got banned because one of my boys uh, was smoking weed outside. Sure. Yeah. And security saw him, and he was staying in my room. Right. Oh, God. And they actually searched my room. And he put the weed in, uh, in the safe box. <laughs> and then the security left, and they said, and they didn't find anything, but they're like, you know, you're banned. <sighs> and I was like, what do you mean? He's like, yo, you're banned. Yep. And I just Damn. never worked. Guilty by association. Yeah, I just yep. never worked at- uh, Forgot. Forgot. Well, then- a, a few years passed, and then they lifted the ban, and I was doing, um, I forget what what it, where Premiere is. Mix. Mix. Yeah. Yeah, so I started doing mix again, right. and they started bringing me back. They were very tight. Like, I remember yeah. having to, f like, arguments with them because I was trying to get Homicide in, mm -hmm. and um, they wouldn't book him because of his name. Yeah. Yeah. That's so hard. And I was like, That's, um, a, hard, that's a hard one to sell on billboards. Yeah. You know, in, in Vegas, they used to have Homicide Teacher Fridays. Homicide on Fridays. <laughs> oh my no, God. I think it said Homicide Fridays. No. Love. Oh, it was a homicide Friday. And so these billboards, and it just says like Jet Homicide Friday. And I remember <laughs> everyone was like, "What the it's, fuck?" He didn't have no problem in LA. Like it was like Red Cup Sundays and it's I, like Homicide or yeah. on Playhouse or at. I Frankie. just texted Craig because I was in this like hole in the wall ramen spot in Shinjuku, Tokyo, mm -hmm. and they were playing Sugar Ray. Oh, and I was real? like, bro, I fucking love this. Yeah. <laughs> Shout to Homicide. Shout to Homicide. Yeah, Just yeah, the yeah. homie. All right, so you're drinking at this time, and this is when you're becoming an EDM, kind of more of an EDM guy, or no? Yeah, uh, this is pre the EDM thing. The EDM thing was like 14. And this is when you're like kind of just gigging all over the country. Yeah. And now I'm signed to Stadium Red, and then um, that kind of ran its course. Yeah. Uh, that management just wasn't really for me. And then I signed to 4 a.m. Mm. Uh, so now I'm just Wait, where, where did 4AM come from? 4AM was started by a couple people in New York uh, Adam Alpert Adam Alpert who managed Adam Alpert Oh wow yeah. He incubated the Chainsmokers at 4AM So this was like 2009 Shout out to Adam Alpert Yeah It yeah. was like mm -hmm. The original partners were like Adam Alpert, Johnny Lennon, Jusky I think that Yeah was shout out to there Jusky I knew Jusky was a part of it Yeah, yeah. Um, So then I signed 4AM just as an artist and um, that's actually where I met Madison back. And then by that time, was Mood Swing already phased out a little bit? Or They were still doing their they thing. They were still doing their yeah, thing? they were still doing their thing. I met, I mean, Mood Swing was in... A, what, a, what made you not go back to Mood Swing? Um, because if I you think, left, you know? I think I felt like I had burnt that bridge mm. or... Um, they were pissed that you left. Yeah, I think I think Ricky was tight that I had left. Yeah, um, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, I, I don't... I still talk to Ricky. Uh, you yeah, know, I still yeah. I don't burn bridges unless I have to, which yeah. is pretty much never. So um, we we you know made peace, but I think at that time he was like a little like Meh. right, right, right. Yeah, Cause I get you, it. Because you guys built or something from maybe, scratch. Oh right? yeah, we yeah. built it from nothing. Or maybe I thought that four AM was like cooler at that right. time. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't know where now we're entering like the one oak era mm -hmm. a little. Yeah, bit. for sure. And Jusky's at One Oak, and it's just mm -hmm. like, all right, I mean, I'm going like, to be part of the like the, the hotter yeah. clubs. Tau Group is like running everything at that point in New York. I also think a big factor probably for you at the time was the Chainsmokers component and the going in the dance music direction. Which we also kind of skipped over, but the Chainsmokers also were originally on Stadium Red with me. So mm -hmm. I know Alex from way back when it was the original two members of the Chainsmokers. Yeah, right. can we talk, do you know a lot about this story with the Chainsmokers? Sure. Yes. We know I've heard pretty much everything. I've heard rumors about it. What have you heard and we'll let you know. <laughs> okay, so what I've heard was, you know, obviously the Chainsmokers that we know now is not the original group. It's not. It was right. Alex and Red. Okay, it was Alex and Red. Red and then Pixler. somehow... Red with Red a T. Pixler. Red oh, Okay, Pixler. Red. Alex and Red. DJ. Yeah. And then somehow, right before, like... Chainsmokers blew up. Uh -huh. One of them got replaced, or one of them, Correct. Uh, right? Yeah. He got replaced, or did he get bought out, or something? So or? I think. Well, do you want to? Because no, I, you. Oh yeah. But, but, <laughs> I'll let you take. This but let's one. say, like in <laughs> in the early New York stages, and this is probably when Pittsburgh Slim was popping. Oh my God! That right? name. I think he was on Mood Swing. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. I think Pittsburgh Slim. Okay. What was this? Girls Kiss Girls. Is that what yep. the song? Yep. Yeah. And, it was uh, a joint, actually. <laughs> it was it was huge. Yeah, yeah it was massive. And uh, it was paused. But and and then um, around this time, I think the Chainsmokers were just like running around, 
doing these like small they were house EDM gigs. Yeah, they were like very local. Mm-hmm. They were just local dudes, and they and then there was two of them. Yep, and then one of them, what they got, I don't know if they got kicked out or if he got bought out or something happened. Um, so you know, I don't know if I don't want to speak to exactly what right. happened because I'm not exactly sure if someone was bought out or kicked out or mm-hmm. what have you. But I had a, fe- a feeling that Adam wanted to bring on a more like someone that made music and what have you so kept the duo together so Rhett was replaced by drew (coughs) and drew uh i think drew was either going to berkeley at that time or had just finished and then he was the producer what have you and then that's when yeah singer songwriter Mm -hmm. uh, producer and then that's when they started making music and then like you know kind of uh entering the where like selfie selfie came out and like that stuff Okay, wait. So selfie was the first. That was of, the big. That, that was, was the, the first. I remember great. that. That was the big one. Yeah, but it was like, it was like, douchey EDM. Mm-hmm. Um, a it, bit. It was like not blog house, but like, not big room. It was like a kind but of. But it was kind some, of indie. It was, it was something that I would have imagined came from the West Coast, not the East Coast. Almost right? tropical, like yeah. almost. Yeah. Okay. It's like that chunky, but it was kind of like fist pumpy EDM. Yeah, it had a little right? something Big, to it. Yeah. Definitely not like East Coast house or dance, Mm-mm. in my opinion. It because was very log house. When right? I heard it, yeah, when I heard it, I was like, "This is from like New York dudes," like because it didn't sound like that. Yeah, this is the era of um, was it called hype? Dip? I was just gonna hype, say hype, hype M. M or hype, hype yeah, M. hype M. I'm sorry. So this is that era, right? Also, a little bit. Uh, what was it like? fratmusic.com or whatever like <laughs> right <sighs> oh fuck yeah i got in, that was that was yeah my it was hype m era so like they were crushing on those charts the hype so M-X. they were doing like soundcloud plays they were really but that was the first hit that came from the new chain smoker kind of i would say duo. they had some really successful ones but selfie was the one Not yeah as massive as that yeah by yeah. far yeah it changed everything it changed everything Right, and then this is like Moonbaton coming, and then, and then. Ooh, like, I don't know when that era. It was like started. the emergence of that. A Moonbaton little bit, was right? like fifteen. I think was before that. Really? Well, no, but like where all the, it was kind of like everyone was sick of, like the one twenty eight EDM. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then Moonbaton just started crossing over with like Snake and then yeah, all and, and all of these and Diplo with uh, uh Skrillex. Major Lazer and yeah. all of this mm-hmm. shit. We should bit. have for like organizational purposes, we should have really been like had like a chart, a chart on the wall. A flow chart. Of, like this yeah. club was this era, this is when this music came I, out. I know Moonbaton was like <laughs> it's been around for a long time. Yeah, but it was like fifteen. I don't remember. That era is is a, a blur. But this is around the er- time when Moonbaton started crossing over yeah. and becoming mm-hmm. like a new EDM. Genre. we never that we yeah. never thought that i never thought thing. like edm would be in a 105 right 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 bpm no. right yeah they started using electronic sounds at a lower tempo yeah yeah slower. yeah which was like the to me at that time on a commercial level was the introduction of chain smokers and zed and all of this shit mm. a little bit right mm. who was the one that had like was it zed what had roses no, that was chain smokers. That was chain smokers too. Yeah. What was the other one then? But there was, I think, a lot of Zed action. One oh five. In the one oh five, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. So now oh, I'm just an artist okay. on four AM and everything's going fine. Um and then the Adam at some point and the chain smokers separate from four AM. Um he goes to Sony, starts disruptor starts his own thing mm, mm. and at that point um johnny lennon had like not been a part of the company for a long time so it was really just adam and Juss, and Juss was remaining and Juss was like i don't really know how to do this can you help me so and, you need operationally yeah he he was like i think um you can like help me with this and i was like okay and he gave me half the company we're leaving also a critical part of Go. the story. Oh out. my god! Sorry, I totally skipped that. You're right. <laughs> Which is that there was uh, not to go into too many details. I was working for a completely different agency at the time that was basically in the process of merging with 4AM. Mm. Um, yep. Translation: I was running two agencies at once, <laughs> basically. And to put everything in perspective, <laughs> with as- zero experience. <laughs> You were how old at this time? Uh, 23. Wow. <laughs> Jesus. 23, running basically two full what agencies. What was the other agency? EXA. It was called EXA. So um, 
I started working for them like right when they first started. Uh, it was just another like startup DJ booking agency or management company. Doing mostly like local New York stuff. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um, so they were in the midst of this deal of either acquiring or merging with 4AM. What was the, what was the, the, the purpose or the intention of that? So it was around the time that Adam was preparing to transition out to start the label at Sony. So it was kind of like, uh, what was this other agency called? EXA. 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 So it was kind of like EXA had the operations behind it. Exactly. And then 4AM was like, we need the operations. Exactly. Yeah. And they have all this organization. Mm-hmm. Right. So let's merge with them because we have maybe the clientele and we have... The DJs. The DJs. Yeah. And EXA had some like other DJs, up and coming DJs. And it was sort of this complimentary fit of like, okay, maybe we have like the opener and closer DJs right. for these more prominent DJs oh, like Chachi. 4 a.m. It's kind of like Dexstar mm-hmm. when AM passed. Mm. If they merged with a company, mm-hmm. they may have been able to still be around. Right. Yeah. Because they had all of. AM's contacts and like exactly. they had that name and branding and they really yeah. had the headliners yeah. I mean they had Dexter yeah. at that time had such a strong team it was crazy yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so from Stevie weeks. Oki to Jazzy Jeff to mm. scene fashion I mean uh, spider everyone. like crazy yeah. they had the all-stars um, so this all of this has to That's perfectly how we met. has to perfectly happen and also not happen for me to become a partner of 4AM and then for me to actually realize that Madison is everything in this whole equation. So did you steal her from the other agency a little bit? I I actually approached Jess. Right. Um, it didn't look like the deal was going to Go happen. Through. Yeah. But we had already been operating as if it had for like a year plus at this point. Okay. Um, and the other agency basically decided to close operations. They... They informed me on like a Monday or Tuesday they were going to close the doors on a Friday. Um, at that point, I was kind of like, what's going to happen to all the DJs that we've been trying to start their careers and, you know, this whole deal and all this stuff. Um, and they were just out. They went into a totally different line of work. Um, and I approached. What was the issue that they closed shop? Well, <coughs> they actually they now have a really really successful real estate company okay uh it's a very long story we were sort of scrapping it working out of this like williamsburg warehouse they met the the you know landlord who turns out he owns a lot of uh new york real estate and they basically had two startup companies going at the same time i was actually helping them a little bit with both um and i think they were just kind of being pulled into two different directions and realized we have to pick one and we're going to go with the one that's instantly more lucrative for us. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it ended up being the right decision for them by far because they were like, let's dissolve this agency. They were just like, this is a lot. This is a lot of politics. This is a lot of drama. This is a lot of personalities. We're just going to be out. Yeah, because the DJs aren't easy to work with. Yes. Right. Yeah. It's an uncertain industry. Real estate is like, you know, buy this, sell this. Still really, yeah, but it, it was the right choice for them. Um, and so as that was all kind of, I saw that happening, I just approached Jess and I said, listen, if you can figure out a way to pay me, I'll come run everything. Like, just let's mm. have continuity here. I don't want to leave anybody scrambling. Like, I felt a really big responsibility to the DJs that we had been working with. I felt like everyone became really reliant on us. Well, after a year, you had everything pretty much streamlined, right? Yeah. 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 So, it, and for Jess, it was just... It, it made perfect sense yeah. to just be like, yeah, just keep doing what you're doing and we'll right. pay you. Exactly. And he was the one who said, I feel like it, we need some, I want somebody else to kind of come on board here who the DJs trust and like respect and admire and look up to, who's also, you know, really successful in his own right. And that's, you know, the choice behind approaching Chachi. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how did you get half of 4 a.m.? What was your role? Like, what did you was, actually At that point, I mean, I was just... I was another partner in the company. So it was just me and Joss would own the company outright. And then Madison was working for us. But then once I learned... But for him to come to you, I'm just trying to get clarity on on the situation. Mm -hmm. When he was like, yo, I think you can run this. What what did he mean by running this? Like for you, in your your perspective. At that point, Adam was operating the company. Yeah. Joss was... um, 
as he was an owner, mm-hmm. he wasn't in operations. Right. He and was, he was signed to the company. You know, he was, he was also a DJ. The yeah, yeah. But he had also was involved in lots of other projects himself and didn't really have the bandwidth to uh, be that point person for the DJs, almost like A and R style, like kind of yeah. like across all those areas. So he he wanted Chachi to come in and so take over that. I, in in essence, I would be taking Adam's spot. And, and I would. And what, what what were some of those duties that you had to take over? Every, um, pretty much all, kinda, everything, yeah. everything. I mean, once we got involved, like we kind of just. There were a few, I feel like, eras of this in the first few years, but as soon as we got into the room together, it was sort of like, okay, who who else do we want to sign? Who else? You know, it was all of that, and he had all those relationships. So yeah, specifically. It was, so you basically you got you know you took uh, Albert's uh, position mm-hmm. right. And then you had to kind of like figure out exactly what was the new direction for Foyam. Sure. Exactly. And then operationally, Madison was already on board. She had already been working for us, with uh-huh. us. So I was like, mm-hmm. this is, makes so much sense. Right. And then as soon as I knew that Madison was really actually everything, mm-hmm. I was like, oh, you need to be a partner too. Because if Madison leaves us, we're really fucked. We're, we will crumble. You know, we can't do everything. So I was like, we have to keep you. So then we made Madison a partner as well. Interesting. So I uh, wait. I, I'm still trying to figure out what you have to like actually, like what 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 are you executing every day? Like at that time, you know, everything, soup to nuts, bookings, reach outs, bookings. sales, like, sales. Okay, okay, okay. Having Organization. conversations with club owners and managers. Relationship. Got it. Introducing got it. me to people right. and or selling. That's very DJ. different, though, right? It's new, no. It was complete. I had no experience. So how did you? How did you just hop into that? And what in your head made you think you could do it? I just knew. I just feel like he's been doing it all his life, but just for him, not for anybody exactly. else. That is exactly. Yeah, because like his come up, the the fourteen year old being at the eighteen year old party, all the shit. He knew how to relationship. He knew how to move in the room. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's easy just to put him in the room and be. You're yeah. kind of like the face of four AM now. Right. But he needed his backup, which is Madison. So that makes a lot of yeah. sense. So you're, so you're handling basically uh, everything from sales to operations with like itineraries, all the above, uh, damage control with DJs, mm-hmm. everything. Uh, just talking with clients mm-hmm. and trying to find new ways of getting more clients, and then uh, and right. still doing your own DJ at the same time. Correct. Yes. Right. So yeah. now and, I'm, and, now I'm double duty and producing at the time. Yeah. yeah. There was a lot like that was similar timing of you having your. Uh, singles with Spinning. Land, land, yeah, I was I was signed to Spinning at that time. I had a I have a sing a song. I have two songs out with them. One of them has like 18 million streams on Spotify. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm like heavy in my own career. I'm still gigging. I'm still traveling every weekend and doing this. Question: I, How many DJs you have on the roster at this point? Ooh, back then I don't remember. Maybe uh, roughly. Honestly, I feel like it was all. Oh, it always sat somewhere between fifteen to twenty. But okay. it, yeah. that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. But it when we first started, like I had a lot of people that I was kind of like responsible for that technically weren't like didn't come over. So we just had like kind of like a big network at that point yeah. in time. Whether we were actually managing. You know, all of them. Was yeah, because I was trying story. to think of how many people was he taking care of, like the itinerary, all the shit. So plus we were, we were doing it all together. Yeah. So Damn. yeah. Um, but it was like I thought it was perfect timing because I was like, look, I've been on the road for at this point, you know, I don't know, ten or fifteen years. Mm-hmm. I've got all these relationships. I've played all over the country and all over the world at this point. Right. I just have to go. Hey, if you like me, you'll probably like X, Y, and Z. Mm-hmm. and introduce DJs. And the, so I had the network. Madison really had the know-how of like the back end. And like I had been I unknowingly doing sales. Just I was only selling myself. Right. So now I'm selling other people. So like, all right, walk me through your work week, your daily. Back then routine, or now? Right, back then. <laughs> so like on a Monday. After the weekend, Monday, how does it go? Did we have the studio? I would... <laughs> I would pull up to Chachi's apartment building. <laughs> oh, oh, we didn't have the studio yet. Okay. <laughs> I don't oh. think so. Oh, I lived on 29th Street now. Yeah. Okay. So I lived in uh, like a fancy building on 29th Street. Uh-huh. Um, I became friends with the doorman and I would just see myself in at, you know, nine in the morning while um, he'd be sleeping. 
Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. So it had this huge common area on the roof that we basically made our office. Right. So everyone would meet, and then we Who's started. Everyone. We had some. We, we started, started to hire hiring people. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we started to hire people to like. We were like, all right, we need we, we need to do some events now. I need so like a hired, social media person, right. and I need like a kind of like a techie person that can help us. We at the time we're trying to like build our own. Website, cloud-based yeah. uh, system, back-end system, <laughs> yeah. So we would just meet at my apartment building. Right. So that was the office. So I would eventually, whenever I would wake up, because I was still gigging, so my sleep schedule's still all jacked. So everyone's there at 9 a.m., they're yep. getting to work, yep. and then mm-hmm. you maybe work it, wake up at noon, noon yeah. you walk in, Yep. and then you have we like- have some meetings or something in the afternoon. And then you have your meetings, right? and then mm-hmm. what is it, just be getting updated on the weekend, and then just everyone's, and like any new clients that are on the table. So it's yeah. like, yeah. first things first, you knock out, how was the weekend? Right. Uh, do we have any problems? Was do we there have, any damage control? We do we have to, to put out any fires? Which right. usually, yes. <laughs> also, actually, the funny thing is usually if there is a problem, yeah. it happens even before that. Right. It's almost like instant. We right. always like you bad hear news. You it the night of or the morning. Usually after. the moment. The yeah. moment is happening. Bad news travels fast. Right. And if we don't hear anything, yeah. no news is good news. With the DJs, what what is the typical damage control that you have to take care of? Depends on the DJ. Day. So we have been called. Is it when drinking? Sometimes. It could be drink. It could be drinking. It could be drugs. It could be an altercation with a client. An yeah. altercation with Verbal a manager. Verbal misunderstanding. We've had um, DJs assaulted. We've had like uh, okay. Um, it like it could be everything. People have called us from jail. It's like. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten more than one phone call from jail. Right, nice. and we're like, call your parents. Like, what do you do? What? Don't call me. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not your mom or dad. Like, I'm not coming to bail you out. Like, mm-hmm. please call your parents. Has Has there been an incident where you had to let go of a DJ and drop them because they were just so much of a problem? Oh, because of there was so much of a problem. Yeah. Um, uh, I think for us, it never has really felt like a very explicit like we're dropping you for this exact incident or reason. You just start to see the sales decline. It would start to just, we would mutually kind of part ways. It was repetition of just bad shit. Most of the time, it's like this culmination of like, you know, if somebody is getting that fucked up at work or like not performing, I bet our working relationship isn't that great either. Mm. And it's just like, this isn't a fit. That's usually all it is. It's never like a smoking gun, like this happened, go fuck yourself, goodbye. Right, right, right. It's never that. All right, so then this is your day goes. You're having meetings around noon. So we're and, working every day, uh-huh. and then I'm still gigging on the weekends. And in the studio at night. So, right. I would do days with 4 a.m. Uh, I would do nights. I think we had the studio at this time. We Yeah. The so I rented a space studio. out of the music building on 38th Street, uh-huh. um, and I was sharing it with a couple DJs where I, we basically built out a recording studio. So I would do days at my apartment common area with 4 a.m. and I would do nights in the studio because I'm producing at this time. Right. Um, And then weekends I'm on the road. Interesting. So like at this time, did you feel like you were overextended? Yeah, 100%. 100%. (laughs) So how long did this last? A lot. Uh, I mean, I'm still doing it right now. You're still doing it. <laughs> Wait, what do you, what's changed in the past? Like, when, what year was that when you got That's like 2015 15. or 16. 15. Yeah. So like, what, nine years, eight, nine eight years, years ago. Past. It's the same thing I just asked you guys. It's like, how long did it take for you guys to really get this process down? Probably. With and, the yeah. podcast? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's the same thing with almost anything. If you, you're continuing to streamline it, get better at it you know, fix problems. Right. So we're just like, we streamline the process. Now we have back end systems. I mean, like when we first started, it was like spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah. What and, I, and I did not, I did not know what I was, you know, like I had no prior experience and basically it was like learning how to build and run a business mm-hmm. from bootstrap. scratch. Bootstrap stuff. Yeah. No, no financiers. Like we're scraping this together and we're just doing this you know straight start for the style. love of it <laughs> so I, I, in my head i would say the first year or two you're doing a lot of every, you're doing everything yourselves and we're also doing something we have no idea right. how to do we're just like i think this is right learning as a guess, yeah I was. all day mm-hmm. and also working with some really incredible talent during that time sure. where there, you know, everyone was kind of in a little bit of different lane and we were kind of learning as we went with a lot of people. Oh, so man. like we were just 
every th- aspect of our business, we were learning as we went. And like how many different aspects are there's a, every, a million aspects. Like mm-hmm. we were learning who's supposed to be, how to market people, how to, it was, it was this just. This is like, and then you're having like Snapchat come out. Like you're trying to like juggle all the social media. Right. We're learning, like social media is really, now social media is not social media. Like now I'm not posting like a picture of me at the beach. Now it's a tool. And like now we have to learn about like marketing campaigns. Mm-hmm. And we were like learning as we went with new pieces or new tools and like our industry evolving it was like mm. it was a fucking lot so i mean madison your, your background you're from nyu are yeah. you from new york no so i grew up in south jersey mm-hmm. right outside of philly right um and then i went to nyu and never left never left, never left. but you 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 have uh you, you you studied journalism political science yeah right and this is just not what are you doing in night yeah why are you I, I have no idea like, you guys why are you taking care of dj <laughs> um yeah like, well, how did you get into this area because it doesn't seem like it she read an ad and she yeah. said for hire i don't want to skip over that one point because kidnapped. we literally do take care of djs yeah so true <laughs> i'm sure um yeah i thought i was going to go into broadcast journalism mm-hmm. that was what i always dreamt of doing and um studied it at NYU, had a professor who was this OG bad bitch, like pioneer first ever woman on the news, one of my professors. And she just kept it super real. My senior year, she was informing us all, you know, if you really want a career in this, you have to be willing to move to the middle of nowhere right after college and be a Jack or Jill of all trades behind the camera, in front of the camera, um, be down to be isolated and, you know, be in a really boring place for a couple of years. That's what it's going to take. She was sort of right because like a year after that was kind of when anybody could be a journalist from anywhere and like you didn't have to do that. So Mm -hmm. I think I was just like a year or two too early in graduating um, and I knew I wanted to stay in New York. I was not ready to leave New York City. I felt really strongly called towards staying here in New York. Right. Um, Because you have that broadcast journalism voice. (laughs) Yes. You can sell lotion. (laughs) Don't don't count me out yet. Well, you can do the news, you know? Don't count me out. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And basically, I mean, I was a party girl. I was my sorority president while I was at NYU. Mm-hmm. Um, this was in the 2009 to 2013. I didn't even know NYU had sororities and all that. Hell shit. yeah, they do. There's parties. It's a okay. small, yeah. It's a it's a small piece, but so you guys are in the village, just wilding out in the yeah. East Village. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we were. Uh, but we were going to the club, like we were going out to clubs. Um, so that was probably my foray into everything. And we used to throw parties all the time. Welcome week was a huge thing. We would throw parties at the club. Um, so that was my first Didn't taste. you run the door or some shit? After, as a, I don't know if I was still in college or right after, I started running the door at certain clubs and certain parties, like um, Cashier, working with certain yeah. promoters. Yeah, doing all those like front of house kind of jobs, um, which, you know, I enjoyed. It was fun. It was easy to make money. Um <laughs> So, yeah, and uh, my I, I had a bunch of friends who had graduated a few years prior to me, and they decided to start this booking or management company, uh, which is the one that I was speaking about earlier, mm-hmm. that ended up kind of merging with 4AM. Um, they had no idea how they were going to pay me. I was making, like, no money at all. Uh, I just knew I wanted to start working as soon as I graduated, and it was sounded interesting and I wanted to be on the ground floor of something and have a lot of responsibility. Um, And I kind of just honestly like stepped into it and then that's how it happened. It sounds like you just kind of stepped into everything, right? Like along the path. Yeah, Yeah. that's exactly pretty crazy. Yeah. And so like, what's the dynamic, the work, work relation that you guys have now? Like, how does it work? And then exactly at what point were you like, Oh, she's CEO. Um, Sooner than later, honestly, yeah. like even like at because Madison's considerably younger than I am, but mm-hmm. like she was just like always extremely organized, the like hardest working person I ever met in my life, and like right. just such a boss bitch. Um, that I was like, this is she complimented me on everything that was my weak point, you know, like 
we just that's kind of just who we are like she has this like incredible background that complements the things that i don't have and then like i'm the dj portion like she's the most like not dj so like i know i, I mean talk about imposter syndrome i'm like constantly in rooms with djs like <laughs> not i'm not a dj right. how did i get here She's, she was just yin and yang. We're extremely different people, but we're also the same. Like we have the same goal. And then like once we, we really, have same values, same values. And like that we, which we kind of like found later on once we like put together the disaster that we kind of stepped into, mm -hmm. like we got a little bit organized and we started to streamline things and we kind of got some shit together. We were like, okay, let's take a deep breath and like, let's think about how to like really fucking do this. So I was like, okay, look, I've had all of these experiences with all of these different managers and all of, I've had, I got all this shit. I was like, we're music industry adjacent. I was like, all of these managers like aren't really great. Yeah. They're either treating DJs like these like mules and they're just like, go make me money. You know, like it's mm -hmm. very transactional and what have you. I was like, let's take a beat. Let's, rethink how we do this and let's do this correctly so we like stripped down everything that we did and we like built the company up back up with this mantra of like doing the right thing by the djs like thinking about them as like human beings and not just this like transaction we like you know like stripped down our contracts so that they were like these one page contracts that you could just read they were like in layman's terms we always uh made sure that people had attorneys look at them mm -hmm. but if you weren't an attorney you could understand it yeah because i Your had favorite been... little anecdote about <laughs> that contract you signed that said in perpetuity right. the, and you didn't know what perpetuity yeah, meant i sent it to my attorney at the time and he was like do you know what in perpetuity means and i was like no and he was like it means for fucking ever <laughs> he was like these people want all your money for forever and i was like what <laughs> it's like oh and that was one management team that wanted me to sign that mm -hmm. and it was like a five-year contract or something and i was always like i don't know where the fuck i'm gonna be in five years i right. will also say that like with you know, I'm always going to play like devil's advocate for like the, the managers and stuff because <laughs> I don't think it's always this, you know, ill intentioned. Yeah. Like this, like evil, like deliberate, malicious thing. I think like in many industries, people just get used to the way things have always been done. Right. Yeah. And well, don't it, well, it, question it. It comes from the music industry. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. It comes from artist management. Yep. Exactly. You know, there wasn't DJs to to manage and book in the 60s and 50s, right? right? right. So this is, it's new. you know, it's a, it's a new thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it started rough. And I think a lot of people that started the agencies were very opportunistic, right? Mm -hmm. 100%. And they, they, they kind of were, you know, I think it's one of those rare times where we're starting to see the DJs take control. And now in the last five years or more, like we're starting to see there's more agencies with DJs. Mm -hmm. right? right. Like there's, a major, major. Yeah. Companies. There's more agencies yeah. started by DJs. And this is like this new movement mm -hmm. where everything is kind of like getting controlled. And it's like we're putting we're protecting the DJs. For sure. Right. We wanted yeah. to we wanted to reinvent it. I was like, yeah, I want to do this better. For I don't want people to have to go through what I went through. Let's do it better. So essentially, right. like your DJ stuff, you did what you did not like, and you just exactly. took it into the right. good things that it's you did. It's actually like. the same thing that I did with human beings back then. Remember when to I was like, there's career. a lot of DJs. I'm yeah, just going to be like, thing. I don't want to get into drugs. I don't want to do this. I see this person going off on the wrong path. Then we applied it to the to the to company. The company mm -hmm. yes. Which is sometimes important. It's 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 almost more important to know what you don't want sure. than to know what you want. That's it, how you figure it out. Yeah. yeah. It's just learning from other people's mistakes. It's right. super fucking Or your sad. own. I mean, I mean, we which, make mistakes we, all the time. Yeah. 100%, right. Absolutely. So what, what, like, I want to go back to the dynamic of how you guys work now. And I, I think you guys have expanded, like you're doing music consulting. Mm hmm um, I mean, I did a lot of that uh, early in my career, and then we're doing it now, too. Yeah. I've heard there's a lot of money in music consulting. There's a lot of money. There's, like, I just, the more that we kind of dove in into, into like, work, started working with, like, hospitality groups or hotel mm -hmm. groups or, like, there's... Yeah, because these nightclubs are opening restaurants. Yep. And then they're, like, now they're also doing hotels. Yep. So they're going to the DJs that they like, and they're like, yo, make me a mix or do something. Playlist. Like, I, I need, like, so I need the yeah. kind of music that feels like I'm in Ibiza. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, can, can you... And then you just start saying, well, I could create a playlist for you. Right. And you start creating these different playlists for these different uh, situations, events, mm -hmm. 
and moods sure. and you're just collecting all of these things yeah we just started learning that there were so many more ways to make money right like it didn't always have to and the my favorite thing is it was passive income because like I wasn't going to work. I didn't have to actively be at work to make that money. I could just like sit in my underwear, make this playlist, and then make X amount of dollars. I like that visual. Yeah. <laughs> Very visual. Thank you for God. that. God. Yeah. Thank you for that. On the rooftop. <laughs> uh, exactly. Your apartment building. Um, so like we just started to diversify, honestly. Right. But like it still all kind of like came back to our mantra where we wanted to do right by DJs. And we started thinking of these like revolutionary things of like, getting DJs healthcare mm. starting to create uh, retirement funds for DJs yes. like thinking of how DJs, are you implementing that we have tried for it's forever very and Madison can speak it's so to it hard. it's almost impossible for startups to afford it yeah um I started getting into a lot of just like small business advocacy and like that kind of work in the last five years and I think my understanding of how things work at this point, like we're closer than we ever have toward potentially cracking this. Yep. And um, we've done a few key things uh, that we can't yet speak to in the in the last several months that I think will be a pathway toward actually being able to accomplish it. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, it's like starts with our intention. We always just wanted to do the right thing by the DJs and like be the best part of this and not be like this like these evil you know agencies that were just very opportunistic they treated them like transactions and then they just kept yeah. them mm -hmm. it's kind of funny going back to what you said earlier about you know planning for your own retirement at 25 because you didn't think like what's the end to this you know um just to come full circle with like you know wanting to make sure that wasn't a thing that our client like you know our artists and dj clients had to face unexpectedly um and we talk a lot about like legacy planning, like what are you going to do after this? What's that timeline look like? If you think you're going to kind of transition out of DJing, you know, full time in the next one to two years, let's find a way for you to like still um, monetize the relationships that you've built in these right. like, 20 years you've been DJing. Because like, yeah. there's a lot of people who just get out of the game by choice or by life event or something and that just ends there when it could really kind of go back in to feed something bigger so that's something that we're kind of always thinking about and trying to ideate around right can you imagine a dj agent talking to you about legacy planning <laughs> no you never fucking heard that term right that's we're just trying to be better we're trying to do it better and we're oh i mean you know we're always trying sometimes yeah. we miss the mark yeah, but we like definitely. we're doing our best yeah I, I, and like a few years ago i left scam like a scam artist mm -hmm. and i i joined sleeping giant and mm -hmm. one of the reasons I, I went there is because i really trust uh uh fresh one so it's a fresh who's a co-founder co-owner of uh, sleeping giant and mm -hmm. we've, we've talked about healthcare for a minute mm -hmm. and we mm -hmm. literally worked on it for like 10 months mm-hmm you know, like, and we talked to his lawyers, we talked to advisors, we talked to everybody. Where'd you end up? Uh, it's just almost nearly impossible yeah. because of, you know, every, every state has a different, yeah. you yeah. know, it has a different policy and it has, it has different. That's shit, another you know? thing that we didn't actually even take into consideration where DJs live in other states because yeah. we manage people all over the country. Mm -hmm. So it was like, we couldn't even just accomplish it in New York because we either didn't have enough employees or like it right. costs just too much money. Mm -hmm. um, Madison actually really can speak to that more because I didn't. I didn't wasn't. But there's also it. like it, to make it really, really work. You need a, like a couple hundred million dollars. <laughs> yeah. Some big, big on bucks. a national level. Big bucks. On a national level, you need like a couple hundred million dollars, mm -hmm. and it needs you need a bank to f kind of fund it. Yep. And it, it then it becomes this weird thing of like can we get enough people to sign, sign up, up for policies? Yep. Yeah. The more people you sign up for policies. It's like, all right, now we're like kind of like we've have all this money with the intention that we're going to make that much money with the policies. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you don't know if you're going to have 100,000 DJs sign up or and that's really the only way you can get a lower like mm -hmm. a really good policy where people are have like low, you know, yeah. the premium, actual yeah, low good premium health insurance, insurance. Yeah. right? Vision, dental, etc. It's also this. I mean, basically, the short story is that health insurance and the whole way it's set up in this country is fucked up. Yeah. So it's scam. like we would be trying <laughs> yeah. to fix that. Yeah. So I think <clears> like the focus. I mean, I do know some. Um, 
other business owners who, you know, not in New York, not in LA, like in like other markets that they have DJs as employees on their team because they are doing a very specific kind of DJing and it's they can have them on a salary and it's like a totally different game and I'm sure they have health insurance through that company mm-hmm. but uh, it's kind of like it gets into the whole like freelancer stuff yeah. and like the Uber driver like litigation in you know California are they are they gig workers are they not um So that's like a whole other can of worms. But so I think like our focus kind of just shifted to like, all right, like we we used to run like financial seminars with our DJs, like bring people in to kind of especially during the pandemic. That was huge. We opened it up to everybody. Anyone spread the word like we ran. um, So at one point we hired a CFO and then during the pandemic specifically, uh, our CFO uh, also owned an accounting firm. So we were like, okay, we want to give every DJ, not just the DJs that we represent, but our entire network, as much um, knowledge as they can to survive this cataclysmic event that's yeah. happening right now. So we would run financial seminars via Zoom with our CFO. And so were you helping DJs just trying to get like funding? And survive, yeah. yeah. Loans, grants, grants. Yeah. pandemic unemployment assistance, yeah. uh, just like teaching them about anything they could if they had their own, own LLC, like applying for different kinds of just yeah emergency funding it all comes back to trying to do it better caring about the people that we actually work i mean it's it's a lot of like you know it's a lot of paperwork it's a lot of like boring shit Mm -hmm. a lot of filing a lot of uh, like meeting with attorneys and like Mm -hmm. meeting with tax lawyers and all of the shit it's the shit we don't yeah no we want to pop pop bottles play songs tell people to put their fucking hands up (laughs) but it's important to have people that can execute that and they're really good at it's everything Mm -hmm. so like yeah yeah. So is, is that where you come in, Madison, where you're just really good at executing all that crazy shit? Yeah. That the nobody, no, stuff no, no, no creators wants to do. do. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I guess, I guess that's, I guess that's my. She's like life. the fairly odd godmother. <laughs> just a little bit long. It's like, listen, you, know? you want me to sell, uh, you know, and close and perform and what have you. But like uh-huh. Madison is just so much better at a lot of, like I can have these grand ideas, but without Madison backing me up, right. they're nothing. They're, they're dreams. I think also like, you know, going back to our dynamic, I think it works really well to have a creative person who is a DJ who understands all of this the and nuances. someone who is removed and does not. And I'm not looking to get a gig at a venue that I'm also trying to get for, you know, one of my clients. And it just adds kind of a nice balance, I would say. Yeah. Um that is a big reason why the people who have worked with us wanted to work with us over the years. Well, it's, it's just also a blessing. It's not really easy to find good partners. Mm. It's not easy to find good people to work with. Like, yeah. I think I was, you know, I, you know, when we, like you said, we were talking about this podcast, it's taken years to find the people that we have right now. Yep. Yeah. And really like, and then, you know, it gets streamlined and then, you, you know, I'm always thinking about next year, we're going to do this next year. We're going to mm-hmm. do that. But it's like, how do I find the people it's to, very to, the hardest to execute thing. all that? And it, it's really about, you need one person to think big, mm-hmm. right? To think about three to five years or more years ahead. Sure. Yeah. And then you need people who are really uh, like into the details. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's like, you know, when you're thinking big, we can solve any problem, but I really need the people to see where all the little problems are Poke yeah. holes and to formula. like kind yeah. of communicate it out. Because yeah. if you have a bunch of people who don't see the little problems and the details, forget about it. You'll never it, get to that yeah. three in, to five years. In, in two to three, five, yeah. In, do, in two to three years, you're going to fall apart because yeah. none of that shit was taken care of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the, that's really the important the thing. The devil is in the details. Yeah. Madison is all about I'm the it. devil. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, 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 you need, but you need that big picture. You need the visionary to really kind of like you need see, both yeah. to complement each other to right. have an actual formula yeah it's a yeah. complete brain one is the right side of the brain and one is the left 100%. side of the brain yeah. Just yeah. Yeah. often what our dynamic is is me saying something and him saying that doesn't matter because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I'm like and looking at this big pull. shit and I'm like I'm like looking at this and she's like yeah but we have to do A, B, C and D to get to that I know I know I know or like, but I'm look a at big, this big picture. I know, yeah, exactly. Like, this pretty big picture. I'm like, it's gonna be great. <laughs> so, so right now, Chachi, with like your work week, mm-hmm. 
Is the majority of it really focused on the business of yeah, the, the agency? Sure. Yeah. And then are you just DJing for fun now? Or um, no, I'm still gigging for work, for sure. Work, yeah. um, but it's just much more of a balance. Like, I'm working much less. Um, yeah. I slowed my and you're schedule you're okay down. with it. Different I, types of gigs. I love it. I've, like, you know, I mean, I'm 41. Yeah. Like, I don't really want to be in the club that much. Mm -hmm. Like, I, for me to stay up that late, it's actually kind of difficult i'm like looking at two naps it's, it's <laughs> for me to so stay up funny. till five o'clock in the morning i feel like ever since i've known you so it's like been almost 10 years yeah. or about 10 years you your like personality like your baseline lifestyle is so counter culture to dj and nightlife culture I'm like the opposite. he is constantly fighting it like loves like a full like eight hours of sleep minimum <laughs> like you know the yeah. hydration factor like, I'm like not drinking now like i'm all about health i'm like well it's just like now it finally fits like yeah. you <laughs> you yeah, were just trying sure. to do it while you were also you know at the club um, till five or whatever. yeah i'm still gigging still on the road mm -hmm. uh but like we're just at it now like we've never been working harder on 4am before because we have yeah. some really great things in the works part of our like two to three year plan and um it's, it's like a two to three to ten year plan it's been to be honest it's been a, a long time coming to I, see, I see a lot of djs like working in the uh kind of like having office or some type of marketing or having duties behind the scenes like you know chris bachman's handling private events sure you have Marty Rock doing nightlife coordinator. Yeah, he is. Rick Wonder, you know. Uh, he's always held us down with he's marketing He's doing graphic stuff. design and marketing. He's But are you, like, is this just a part of growing your business, finding the talents between uh, different people and saying, look, we'll give you a couple extra dollars if you can alleviate some of this and we can yeah. get you paid? It's like, Or are you intentionally trying to bring in DJs who have a similar mindset to you mm -hmm. that you can just be like, look, like, just come in and then this is, you know, like learn a little bit of this shit and mm -hmm. then like you're, you're going to start seeing that this could be another option for you later. It's a lot of things. I mean, okay. like, I love, uh, I mean, finding good humans yeah. and like this is also another thing. Like we won't manage a DJ or book mm -hmm. a DJ like that we don't like as a person. Yeah. Even if they're like they're going to generate all this money. If they're a piece of shit, like I'm, you know best of luck with somebody else but like we won't work with human beings we don't like mm -hmm. yeah. which actually alleviated and we didn't find out a lot like a lot of the times till like down the road but like that gut and like madison has this unbelievable gut feeling yeah. i don't know what sort of intuition she has or what have you but she's just like mm, like i don't feel it like and we're never like you know you suck or whatever we're just like mm, it's not a right fit best of luck down the road but like finding good humans start there People that are like really talented, like Marty or Rick or Chris, great at what they do, amazing. If I can also give a DJ another revenue stream, another hustle, right? Amazing. It's just like all positive things um, compiling. It, it's funny because like uh, throughout like my you know throughout my decades of business and like being doing entrepreneurship from like clothing brands to podcasts to like sure. consulting to anything, mm -hmm. you really just you're, you know, someone who runs a business and they just hire people, they kind of, they don't get it. And in the end, we're all just kind of investing in people. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're actually just hiring, okay. you know, because like some of the people that I hired and I worked with in a, like when I had a clothing brand, I still work with them now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because we, we just, as you, you know, as you're navigating through life and you're switching careers and you're evolving and adapting, yeah. you always think back to like that person was really solid mm -hmm. what are they doing right now mm -hmm. you call them and then you're like oh shit somehow i don't know what it is you're you like get those calls wow like all day. you fit in perfect here i need this person to do that and we're like well i don't know we're like well we could show you some shit mm -hmm. but i know you as a person and mm -hmm. i'm gonna invest in you yeah and but it really like over the past i would say 15 plus years we really just invest in people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's always going to be like that. Your network is your net worth yeah. is the like most spot on saying because mm -hmm. it will continue to happen to both of us where we get calls of someone that years and years later way back. Yeah. They were just a solid person. We connected and then now they're the in charge of this conglomerate and, and they're like we need to involve 4AM. And I'm like you were like nobody back then, but you were just a great person. But now, like I just knew it, and then now I now it all comes full circle. 
So it's wow. really the people. Mm. Yeah. So like now that like, are you still handling sales and you're dealing with For clients sure. and everything? Yep. hundred percent. Like, uh, for you right now, I, I see you like you're you've got like heavy in Chicago. Best you got, yeah, amazing. I best love guy. him love as him. a teacher. Best fuck, best. great great guy. He's a sweetheart. Best person. Yeah, amazing, yeah. amazing guy. Uh, you, are you like what is your goal for four AM? Do you want to start doing more like you know? Get, obviously, you guys have a, a nice stronghold mm -hmm. in New York and some yep. East Coast, right? What what is your plan? Do you want to start invading? You we know? we are at a really interesting point um, in time where right now we're kind of leaning back into like true artist management. That's what our shift in focus is right Which now. Which is rare in the DJ agency world because everyone wants to be an agent. Yeah, they don't want don't, to. They yeah. don't want to develop anything because so management we, takes a lot. Yeah. So we're we're. <clears throat> Because of certain things we've sort of positioned at this point in time, we now have the privilege of being able to do that. I think that kind of work is truly a privilege, even though it might not be for everyone. But I think being able to truly develop an artist's career, there's nothing like that. And that's what we're going to be digging much deeper into so um that might look like working with some other artists signing some new right. talent um there's some talent on our existing roster that you know ironically has been with us for a very long time that they're kind of uh also at critical points in their careers where they're now, uh, you know, releasing their own music and really trying right. to make it as producers. So, um, we're well, like Rick Wonder exactly. to me, to Rick. me, Rick Wonder, you know, I play almost all of his edits, all of his remixes. <laughs> Same. He's amazing. Right. He's uh, so amazing. Yeah. Great DJ. Great dude. He's at such you know, an, uh, he's right there. He's yeah. at such a important part, um, in point in his career mm -hmm. that it's like, just about to happen like he's already by the way really it's already happened right, too like in many many ways let me preface that yeah. with, it's already happening he's already extremely successful he's uh traveling around the country doing tons of shows he's getting so much love on the internet from his remixes his originals his edits mm -hmm. the size of the djs that are sliding in his dms like i play Pause. all your shit yeah are <laughs> <clears throat> It's it's really incredible. So like, I want to preface it with he's already doing it. Yeah, yeah. I'm su I'm, su I'm surprised he doesn't have a Vegas residency. You know, yeah. Everything is that. Com everything so, is I know. coming. I'm sure. Everything yeah. is coming. I'm sure. Announcement yeah. coming soon. Yeah. But no, no. I'm I'm actually <laughs> shocked that he doesn't have one. Uh, Vegas you know, like, got real. He hasn't had one. Vegas you know? got real difficult for the East Coast guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm. I've x amount of years ago, but it was just like then it was either the Vegas locals got better and better. And they're just far more inexpensive. You just bring them in. They're local guys. You don't have to worry about hotels, travels, beep up, boop up. Or the mm -hmm. LA guys. The LA guys have had relationships with them since the beginning of time. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you're trying to change that. You want to change that. I mean, we want to because take you them. never. I mean, you never had a Vegas presence. I played. Uh, I played Vegas a decent amount, but yeah. no real residencies. Like right. I was super lucky to play like Pure on Tuesdays back in the AM days. Right, right, right. Oh, I think I shit. played Blush. I played the Bank with Icon. Uh, I played Jet. Was that frustrating for you? Yeah, when you kind of sure. wanted more, like because you were in Atlantic <laughs> City, right? Yeah, and you were at some of the best clubs in New York. Some markets, I just didn't get the love that I had kind of expected what do you when you look back on it i mean i'm sure you're fine with it right now but do you what do you think was the issue um i just don't think i had the right relationships right with like i i or like just one owner was just like Meh, chachi like you know that name is stupid but. yeah, yeah. <laughs> i will yeah i will say that the, the that was like a thing what with, we knew like at least in like one market with Oh, it was yeah. like a perception of like, oh, this name, it's corny or yeah, whatever. Yeah, like, no, this is whack. Yeah. yeah. We don't care like that where he plays with, or what he does. Yeah. That paired with maybe not having like the one exactly right timed key relationship is probably the block. I think there was just a couple cool factors that I was missing. Yeah. And um, <laughs> because, listen, like club owners, they gravitate towards the cool. Like well, well, you, seem very, cool, you seem very like- uh, Maybe now. Accept, you seem very <laughs> accept, accepting now yeah. of all of that shit. But at the time, it must have been very frustrating. Yeah, yeah, yeah it yeah. definitely hurt. I was like, I don't understand. I, I've have, I'm getting all this love in all these other markets. And like mm -hmm. the cool markets, like the actual A markets in the, in the country, which is like New York, LA, Miami, Vegas, they're kind of like, meh. Right. 
I feel like you got good love in LA though. Like Playhouse in the uh, back then, yeah, I yeah. was playing playing LA pretty regularly. Um, but like Miami, I definitely got like some pushback. Vegas, I did not get a lot of love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Miami's kind of East Coast. Yeah, uh, yeah, but he, it's his own world in a way. Yeah. Big, big personalities, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's okay. I mean, I think there's a lot of politics with Vegas. All a day. lot, uh, a lot so of fucking politics. You know, so many. There's so many chiefs. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of shit going on with Vegas. I'm yeah. actually like, I'm a little. Uh, I feel like Vegas is a little right now. The scene is mm. a little redundant. Mm. It needs some new blood. I was. Um, I think that's happening kind of everywhere and I yeah. that's like I could talk about that all day but I don't want to <coughs> get off this one point where it's like we are diving back into like managing artists and like really developing their careers mm-hmm. and like I just want to make like Rick is is like about to like festivals like he's about to happen like right, right. and we're working with other artists that are like kind of going in that direction as well so like that's so where Mia, we're Mia really Marati going is doing it yeah. I, I noticed that like you know when I was <clears throat> reading your bio and doing research 4AM is like a talent management mm-hmm. right? Manage- group so but, but they're not an agency no. but that's rare yeah so you guys might be one of the first DJ management like company I think yeah. that's what it was right? originally uh Four, so like four AM is a it's a nod to DJ AM artist management. Right, it's called four artist management. It's a nod to DJ AM, and then it's also New York City nightclubs close at four AM. Oh Miami, yeah. I just thought of four AM. Four AM. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So it's always the intention has always been to manage the DJs. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think that's what they intended intended back then, Mm -hmm. and then we just kind of like adopted it. We scrambled for a little while when we took over, and then now we're kind of like re-leaning into it yeah because for an agent or an agency it alleviates a lot of responsibility yep right and a lot of responsibility and care for the dj Mm -hmm. because it's like in the end it's it's very transactional what's like well if i'm if i'm a booking agent Mm -hmm. i don't really care if i book you or somebody else right Mm -hmm. it's kind of like oh you can't do it then this guy does it right or he'll get it for you know yeah right or it's kind of like well they want you but i get more money for him so i'm gonna try to push him because as a booking agent I just want my commission. Right. Yep. Right. It's very cold. You yeah. know, it's a cold uh, part portion of like our industry. But they are also very essential. So 100% essential. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Especially as you're at different points in your career, I think. Interesting. Well, yeah. like, you know, I have Rick Wonder on here. So like I'm you very know, excited for you guys to chat with. No, him. I mean he's yeah. one of my favorite editors and I love his remixes and uh you know, I've 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 listened to him and uh and I think, yeah, I think he's, I think he's great. I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, I want to see him in Vegas more. You know? he, Let's go. We're gonna make that happen, but like he never believes me. But we have DJs that call us all the time, and they go, "How can I be Rick Wonder?" Yeah, and I go, God "He damn. is the hardest working talk about person that you'll ever meet." I'm like, he, there, like I wake up, yeah. there's like he's like, listen to this new edit. I look at the time, it's like five o'clock, and I'm yeah. like, my god. Yeah. So like. The graphics, the edits, the videos. The, 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 you want to be Rick? Yeah. Work as hard as him, and let's see what happens. Yeah, it's funny you guys have Chisel on from Miami. Yep, who's like a, a young kid who really, really blew up mm-hmm. after the pandemic. For sure. It's funny because I remember we were in Miami. We were recording. What was that? 2019 or 18, 19? 2019 November. 2019. I was in Miami, and Chisel DM'd me and said, "Hey, I'm spinning here." And he was, you know, I don't know. He's like, you know, just like a. A local DJ at the time. Right. And I was like, you know, I I don't think, I don't know if people know this, but I go to, I check every DJ. Do you? I do. I want to do that more. So like but I he's go, very incognito though. He doesn't oh, come the to the wall. booth and like yeah. no no like no, no, yo, I I, I like, say hello. But he's in I don't, the shadows. I don't like letting DJs know I'm there. So I'll, <laughs> right away. I'll, 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 That's important. Yeah, because you want to see them like just authentic. behave. Yeah, uh, yeah. authentic. I want to yeah. see what they play because like you know when they know you're there, it's different. They they everything changes or they show off. They're showing off. Like let me do this routine. That's what I'm saying. He he comes in. He'll grab his cocktail and sit in the corner. Listen to you for a while. And then in an hour and in, he's like, hi. And yeah. the girl yeah. was good. And then, That's the move. I learned that because I remember I used to go see Sean Perry. Mm-hmm. And, you know, whenever I saw him, he was, he like, I remember I would, we would go in, we'd go to the bar, we'd get a drink, mm-hmm. and he'd be killing it. And then as soon as I said hello, his energy just changed. And he got nervous? He, he got or, nervous or yeah. he was just like, oh shit, 
I'm not playing for the crowd anymore. They're going to think I'm playing something cheesy. He started yeah. to like question his decision. And he come, he's like, I fucking suck. And I'm like, no, you don't. Like, you're fucking killing it, you know? <laughs> right. So I, I, I started like not letting motherfuckers know when I'm there. Super because smart. I want them to just play for the crowd. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you want to get them or, like in their organic or authentic yeah, yeah. Like, version of them. You don't want yeah. them to be like, oh, I know Chachi likes this song or yeah. Chachi likes EDM. Just do you. I was I was in San Francisco recently, and uh, you know, Miles Medina and um, Beast. Arcade were like playing at this big spot in Oakland. But right. I checked a couple parties from these local DJs, uh-huh. and they were like, "I would have never thought you would have stopped by." And I'm like, "Oh, I always stop by. That's dope. <coughs> That's dope. I always check." Like it's almost to a point when I was talking to like a booker, and I'm, they were like, "We were talking about DJs." I'm like, "Yo, you need to like, why are you not talking to me?" Because I know the up and coming motherfuckers better than. I think almost anybody in the country. You, you're very well. Like, as far as the country, yeah, I know who's up and coming. Like, I have my eyes open. I'm like, that marketing, that kid's marketing is really good. Yeah. That kid's focused. Maybe not the best DJ, mm-hmm. but you definitely need someone like that at your club. You need someone mm-hmm. who knows how to sell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you need another DJ who's maybe a little bit more low-key, but they just they just know how to deliver, and they could, they could win back a room when you have like a headliner that maybe lost a room. Right. So you need a couple of these things, mm-hmm. but I don't know if Recipe. these bookers know, but like I go out to listen because I want to know, I want to learn from everybody. Sure. But I also want to keep my, my finger on the pulse as to who's up and coming. But yeah. with Chisel, I remember I went to check him out. Young kid. Right. Pretty, had a half empty room. Mm-hmm. You know, he was playing, he was having fun. He was like, you know, interacting with the, with the crowd, with on the, the girls, mic, whatever, yeah. on the mic, and then you know, and I said he's playing the room like it's full, and then I went to see him, and he was like, "Oh shit, you're here!" And I that's was like, a rule. Yeah, you have to play. Wait, was so, he at the art district that yes, we went to? Go that's see where him? we went. Oh shit, that was it. <laughs> and then you know, and it was funny for me to see him like a couple years later after the pandemic really fucking take over yeah. Miami. Yeah. He's doing really well. Where right. I was like, wow, he's headlining Liv. Crushing. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I was like, good for him. And yeah. I think I, I I think we talked briefly on on DM, but I was like, you know, that's a, that's one of those things where it's like... You guys should have him on if you do like Miami. Yeah. Yeah. I do. I want to talk to him, but I, I like to talk to DJs that had like I don't want to talk to them on their rise up. Uh huh. I want I Once want them to get, fall a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I want crashed them to, it a little bit. <laughs> no, no, no. I think I was like, ouch. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I, think, I think because sometimes, you, like, if I interview someone on their rise, sure. they're, they're like a dreamer. Everything is everything. Ooh. Everything is well. Good. Like when all the doors just keep opening, like yeah, maybe your perspective is yeah. like a it, skewed. It's like you know, it's like I'm not getting the reality of how to really navigate a career yeah. mm-hmm. because you're from a perspective where. It's this not this is never gonna end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know yeah, yeah. when you have that journey when you're DJing and you're like, this is I'm killing it right now. This is you know. I re- I had many of those moments, yeah. but I was like, <laughs> I remember being in like Hong Kong, and I'm like, what the fuck am I doing here? Like this is like really my real life like yeah, right yeah. now. Like I'm in China or like I'm playing in Tokyo, and mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. But I I don't i i don't mind speaking to a dj like right. when they're on their rise or on the come up sure. or, but i want to hear a little bit of like i want to see how did you handle the turbulation how yeah, did you yeah. Handle i want to see the hustle i want to see like yeah. when when you were at your at, at your top right. and then you fell and then how did you work to get back Climb up back. right yeah. yeah to me i want to see that consistency and unfortunately i don't really see that in a lot of djs till their early 30s mm-hmm. or mid 30s right you know what i mean sure I want to see that perspective and I want to see that that kind of that wisdom of like, oh, my approach to this was wrong. Uh By the way, I'm glad that you're saying specifically like mid 30s, like that would be maybe when you start, you face some sort of challenge and then have to climb back and then could have an incredible career even after that moment because the age thing that I hear from everybody, oh my God, like it is, it weighs on people. Like they especially in this, I think, career, because it's so optics, like aesthetic, oh, everything. No. How do you, uh, and I, I want your opinion on this as well, how do you feel about like, um, or I f- have heard for forever that this yeah. is like a young man's game or young woman's mm-hmm. game. I don't believe that at I all. I actually but... uh, don't believe that anymore at all. No. And I think that the age um, struggle is all in your head. I, because I think that 
as long as you can physically do it and like whatever your personal life you have going on, I don't think you have to be like 25 to be like crushing it anymore. Uh, you know, <laughs> like rest in peace. Never, never was 52. Right. And I always looked up to him because I didn't know a lot of DJs in their 50s that could still rock a club. Mm -hmm. Shout out to fashion. And fashion 50s. as well. Shout yep. out to fashion. That had their like finger on the pulse with new music. Mm -hmm. yep. That had the the longevity and the ambition to just really continue to rock a crowd right. and to stay close to the clubs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You I know, mean, every everyone kind of phases out. I want to retire. I want to yeah. do whatever. You know, I and I think the lifestyle is hard, obviously, yes. but it's challenging. It's but challenging. But I don't think I think the age thing. You know, there's a lot of DJs that blew up in their late 30s. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I don't want to put their names out there because I don't know if they their they age, feel like yeah. you know they age, right. but. There's a lot of DJs that blew up and they're they're huge mm -hmm. they're, and they're like in their early 40s and they're just starting to do Vegas and right. they you know you know it, to me it, when you're in your 20s I always tell DJs in their 20s I'm like you're so dope now but I want to hear you when you're in your 30s mm -hmm. yeah because I think the best time to hear a DJ is when they're like 31 32 mm -hmm. that's they've taken all their wisdom and their, their, their knowledge of how to read a room mm -hmm. and they've gone through these phases of what music they like. Yeah. And they've, they like, you know, they could be killing it at 23, but I'm like, they could be gone at 27. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They could be yeah. out of the, out you of know the what game. I'm saying? Yeah. Or they just like, some people get like, um, they don't know how to adapt. So they just get caught up in one era. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're like, Oh man, I was killing it during the blog house era, but I didn't know how to adapt to this era. Yeah. And then, but when you see these DJs have to adapt to different eras, mm -hmm. In their thirties is usually when they're like, Oh, this they're at the top of the game yeah. right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. yeah. I love to hear a DJ in their early thirties because that's to me their most confident. And then they're, they're I think something happens in their mid late thirties mm -hmm. where they lose a little bit of something. It's possible. And then they have to gain it back maybe in yeah. their forties or they, they have hopefully another direction. They do, right? yeah. yeah. There's this one DJ that's uh if you don't follow them, uh you should check out his Twitter. It's chapter and verse. Mm -hmm. He's a DJ from the UK and I think he just started his career very recently. I believe yeah. it's like five years ago, but he's in well into his forties wow. and he's being very successful. He makes house music. Uh, and we like found him just by like really enjoying his music. And then we kind of learned a lot about him, but like he speaks about this kind of game and the age thing and what have you like a lot. And like, we have really changed our opinions on it. And mm -hmm. like, we don't think that age is thing. We think yeah. you can crush it kind of like at any age now. Well, well, the problem is now is that I think what I've been noticing, and this is, you know, a very broad statement this mm -hmm. is not all djs but all young djs i want the comment section yeah. to, to get ready right now get your thumbs yeah. ready <laughs> but I've, I've noticed from younger djs they don't have the talent of reading a room mm -hmm. forgotten art they've it's a it's it's just an i think there's a couple of things that have that caused this mm. i think it's the hour sets i think it's not opening i think yep. it's like headlining sets doing two hours yeah and i think it's also the fact that everyone's so self-absorbed and everyone's like a tastemaker. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a combo, I know, you know. Yeah, it's a combination of like not having to cut your teeth from DJing for six fucking hours. Right. Like those sets made me like who I am. But there's no venue that uh, gives that platform to a DJ to do six hours that Correct. much. Not Correct. often. Not, not often, often, but there's some. Yeah. Because not I often. do. I do between four to six now. But you have never. You would have never done those sets no. if you left. Ca if you didn't leave California. No, L L A. It was. You headline from twelve to one thirty, right. and then Lights but on. at that point you're playing every fucking hit yeah. that just happened. After after fifteen, almost twenty years of of DJing, right? Uh, you know, like you know, for me, maybe over twenty years, I've noticed with a California DJ, uh -huh. they have a great forty five minute power set, right? And then the next, if they're doing a two hour headline set, uh -huh. forty five minutes crushing, right? And then the last fi hour fifteen. They're really they're trying, trying to figure it out. They're just treading water, right? Or they're mm -hmm. reaching. They're Matt, reaching. Mad, you. I feel like you're. No, you're I was just. Up. I was just gonna say. Um, first of all, I don't know if this is a controversial opinion, but <laughs> I don't know if a venue was gonna offer a six-hour set that any of these younger DJs would do it. They, I think they would. I. I think they're lazy. Maybe the cream would rise to the top. Sorry, that's I. I so. Go ahead, Kurt. Go ahead. No, you say. <laughs> no, said. well, I was going to say, because when I would be in LA, you get an hour. And then when I came to Vegas, 
my first gig was four hours and I was like, how the fuck am I going to manage this? Mm-hmm. Right. But I had to figure it out. But that's where the, after the hour and a half, you have to figure out the room. Mm-hmm. You have to figure out who's in the room, what they like. Yeah. And that's how you really hone in that reading in the room type of shit. My other thought also about why that reading of the room is maybe a lost art with some of the younger DJs is just like a technology thing. Like the barrier of entry to DJing is so different than it used to be that people can learn, you know, at home and like kind of like play just for themselves or broadcast a stream on Twitch or something where you're not actually seeing people. I I don't think it's that. I think what happened is I think EDM kind of fucked it up because mm. EDM created That's, the superstar yep. look at me DJ I'm the center of if I'm you. the center of attention yeah. and let me let me control this crowd by playing my music mm. yeah. my production yeah. so that kind of DJ AM working club <laughs> DJ mm-hmm. that he was that he, he was a working club DJ that came that was broke sure and yeah. he made it yeah. mm-hmm. from fucking Philly and he became this Hollywood celebrity DJ right. so for us we were like holy shit from an open format working DJ standpoint, we were like, this is the epitome of what we can be. Yep. Yeah. But then when an EDM DJ came out, it was a new formula. Mm-hmm. So everyone is approaching open format like an EDM DJ. Yeah. So they're saying, well, and then all of a sudden they, you had this like uh, these hour sets because there was like a lack of promoters. Mm-hmm. So then every you DJ. a bunch of promo DJs. So you needed lineup. like four DJs on a flyer mm-hmm. to, fill the to club. bring 20 people yeah. each yeah. to fill in the club. So then yeah. now you have these self, Absorbed. self-absorbed, right. you know, influencer, it's like social media DJs. <laughs> we yeah. can get into that. Playing one hour, yeah. Yeah. one after another, playing all the hits, the same hits one after another. So yeah. who gives a fuck about reading a room because I'm playing, I need to play all the hits because my crowd came at my time slot. Yep. Right. Right. Yeah. You don't, totally. ha- you don't totally. have to read, not, actually. You don't yeah. have to read the room. Right. And not giving a... Yeah. I wonder what uh, time period, if we could like try and figure this out. When did the DJ booth move? Because that's part of this. So if you think about it, most DJ booths were not the center of attention. No, they weren't. We weren't on stage. We didn't have no spotlights. We didn't have nothing. We were just like... It playing was, the club it was, it was edm yeah. it was the late uh, it was late 2000s like 2000 early 20s so all these things play a part into this yeah. perspective of who i am and i'm the headliner and uh-huh. you totally know, i didn't come up like but that. E- but even like you know we, we say this all the time but the the arc of what made a dj in the 90s and the 2000s is different you were an introvert oh my mm-hmm. god yeah well you weren't the center you were of a nerd of music now DJ, a dj right. someone who wants to become a dj is an extrovert DJs they, were historically nerds. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Story, because Bring back the nerds. It took so long for you to not suck. Yes. You had to be in your But not only that, like you said, to spend your whole paycheck oh, on yeah. records. 100%. And to just spend, like, remember we were buying records. We would, we would, I don't know how many times I would go to a record shop throughout right. the week. Yeah. I hated it, but I did it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. We'd be in a record shop looking for music. Plus, then when like imports became, it's like I remember buying like Zombie Nation on record, yeah. and it was like you know imports were like ten bucks, twelve bucks. More I mean, than you that, tell like me, sixty uh, yeah. Yeah. Song for one fucking I'm one I'm, vinyl. I'm selling my vinyl right now. I don't know what to do with mine. You know, I'm selling it. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll bro. I'll, we gotta I'll talk. Let you know. Yeah, uh, people gave me their collections, so I have like thirty thousand. Oh wow! Yeah, uh, I'm deep. no, no, no. Like I'm. Like I had someone coming at. at oh, pause. I, I had someone at my crib. Wow. I had, wait, let me talk. Jesus, that. redo that one. Nobody was thinking that. I didn't even <laughs> thought that till you said it. I was like, so wow. Stupid. I was gonna say I had someone it's coming in my crib. So <laughs> stupid. <laughs> That's hilarious. No, I, I had someone at my crib, right? And they were looking through my records, and right. they were like, "This is a hundred. This is two hundred dollars. <gasps> oh, this is. I had like a Sierra album, her first album. Oh, this is sealed right. because I got a promo. Same, yeah. And they were like, "Oh, this is like a." 150 or 100 like and it was just like all of these records and i'm like and the thing is i've never have been original pressings of a lot of shit that yeah i've, I've never been a collector fun. right like i just th- those were tools for me yeah i was a working for, DJ. for me to do what i want yeah mm-hmm. but like i was just like yo just take all they like you sure you don't want to keep a couple cra-? i'm like i don't want any of this shit i've like, almost you know? done that i've almost just basically like sold my collection yeah. and i still just like kind of haven't so like if anybody's listening that like kind of does that or yeah. like wants to dig there's a, couple or, DJ, there's a few djs that are doing that because i i showed it on my uh 
Instagram I stories. Yeah. And everyone just started DMing. I'm me. sure there's like money in there. Just do an Instagram story. Yeah. yeah. And, and then, you know. Because I have like that old, do you remember like the Michael Jackson record with like his picture on it? Mm -hmm. like, the Thriller I, one? Because, yeah, the Thriller yeah, one. Yeah, because yeah. I, the way that I started DJing was from older cousins that used to do like house parties and stuff. Right. So they gave me all their shit. Then when I left that DJ company when I was like 23, that owner was a DJ. He gave me his collection. And so I've just been like wow. accumulating. So like I'm deep. <laughs> yeah, I'm, well, it's possible to sell. I think right now is the best time to sell. Yeah, right now it's crazy. Because the, the market went up after the pandemic. Cool, because my parents hate me. Yeah. <laughs> it's all in the it was garage. At my house. So like my niece is going to college in Boston and she's going to be coming to New York to like my, my mom's crib. Right. So I'm like, I'm, we're trying to make space for her mm -hmm. so she can visit. Yeah. So I'm the like, records. I got to get rid of these records. I've got like comics. I've got like all this old wow. shit. And I'm like, I got to get rid of all this I shit. I was just going through my baseball cards because I had baseball cards Ooh. from when I was a kid. I think there's bread in there. There is bread in there. But yep. talk to me, Chacha. Yep. I don't know about yeah, that shit. I think there's bread in there. Uh, <laughs> well, my, boy, my guys in Boston, they started opening up brick and mortar yeah, card Yeah, card shops is going crazy it's right now. Crazy. They're called the Card Vault. And I was like, when they start, first started opening them, I was like, there's money in this? Yeah, isn't, Bro. The, isn't the biggest money making thing is magician cards? Uh, was the magic cards? The it's it's cards of magicians. What? No, they call magic. Cards. A good friend of but mine. But I thought it was like magician. No, it's not magician. Cards. I don't know. It's that. magic, magic cards, right? Am I? Do you know this? I have yeah. Never. Heard there was this one card in particular, the one we were talking about. I think Post Malone paid one point three million dollars. Oh million yeah, for I it. heard about that. It was the Lord of the Rings. The oh, that was on Joe Ring. Rogan. Yeah, yeah. It was, he paid one point three million but for that. But they're magic cards. It's right? magic. Yeah. It's a game. It's a yeah. game. But it's I don't want to. I thought his... they were like <laughs> no, magicians, no, 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 like no. baseball players. Not like they were playing. <laughs> no. That's what I was picturing when yeah, you were saying. Yeah, it was saying. like a magician. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, bro, right now. David the, Copperfield? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> list. Uh, anyway, right now, during a pandemic, a lot of car shops turn on their IG live and you can send them money for Ooh. whatever pack and they would open it live. And that's how a lot of these car shops just came up, oh. like Pokemon cards, uh, wow. baseball cards. That's what I was going to say, and I don't want to say his name, but a very good friend of mine has like first edition Pokemon cards. Yes. I, think, I have I think some. he's sitting on like millions. I mean, have you wow. got the Charizards and they're, 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 you know, the PSA to 10 and shit like that? I don't know like the inner workings of it. but The like PSA is the grading <clears throat> system. So if it's Ooh. centered correctly, if the Pokemon ball is centered correctly, everything, wow. there's no chips around there. There's no dinks or anything like that. That's a PSA 10. Wow. And there's a BGS 10. There's only like three in the world. And they're worth about a million to two million. Why do you, why do you okay. know about all this? Because Clear I'm a the fucking schedule nerd. For the week. Yeah. We're both going to our garages. No, but then again, house. like I that invested guy. money on players, like um, uh, Rugs, who was a wide receiver for the for the Raiders, who had that accident. Well, who had the the DUI accident where he killed a girl. Okay, bro, I had like three hundred dollars worth of just investing in his rookie card. All went away after that incident. Uh, and okay. then I have a baseball player by Wander Franco. I have a ton of his first edition. He got caught with some charges now. It's all gone. Wow. So you have those you have those moments. That's like if you had a magician card of David Copperfield, it's more like David yes. Cop Copperfield right Copperfield. now. Copperfield. <laughs> David Copperfield. He's in the list. <laughs> he's on he's on the list. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> I, I gotta tell you though like one of my favorite edits you've ever made and i play it almost every time i dj uh. is the fisher lose yourself and in, in, uh, oh, nice. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah i made all those in the so pandemic good. i like yeah. leaned into 80s it's so good ah oh, thank you it's so it, and right. it always works it's Did just you? perfectly uh like that's what i love about like club djs making edits you know exactly how to make it hit mm. and not waste any like yeah. eight bars here or four bars here or even two bars like it's you know? annoying because then there's the pause and, the, yeah. and then the drop i <laughs> hated that i hated that edm era where they were like oh let's be different and let's not have the drop hit on the one mm -hmm. let's let's fake people out and have it be dead air right and then have it hit yeah oh, I hate that was that. the fucking worst era at a festival him. maybe that's cool but i don't like, think so i think it's not functional i like everything to be i very think that's logical. from a producer's mind who's like who doesn't dj sure yeah they're like oh i want it, i want this to be different right I so, want I want four bars of silence. So right when the one hit, I'm just gonna have surprise them, and then when it hits, they're gonna be like, "Oh shit!" Because like, as a know? club DJ, you're just sitting there for four seconds. Yeah. Like, when is this? <laughs> no, you're watching half the room. Just looking. Leave. At, get excited 
for hitting it the one and they're right. like oh what happened and then it hits and then you lose that energy and then like oh okay it's clunky yeah it's yeah clunky, so you just yeah. lose it all yeah but anyway i just want to say funny. that's one of my favorite ah, edits thank you i appreciate you know. that um but yo thank you for coming through here thank you for madison having us. chachi best of luck with 4am I'm, I'm excited and, thank you uh, we uh we want to put a pin and bit, we'll come back in like uh six months or a year we've got some cool stuff in the works let's do a year or a year let's and a half a year a year and a half or yeah, two sure. maybe you don't want to we'll we'll do it in la though because or vegas because this we'll is make it pretty different. rough out here yo what is here, it 20, like 20 degrees, degrees. <laughs> well i'll tell you this i'm from california and golly the, it, the cold was in my chest we'll come this to morning. you next time no 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 we'll come back we'll come back i like hanging out of when here. listen when rick headlines vegas Perfect. we'll all come that'll, that'll be good because i'm put i'm manifesting that because that shit's gonna happen i it, hope so I, I hope it happens i'm sure it will happen mm -hmm. i'm sure it will yeah i want to I, I want to i want you guys to come through and i want rick to come through i mean rick's gonna come through but i yeah. want i want to uh a reprise uh, episode of all of us together. Sure, but I, I want I want Rick to be out there for a while. Awesome, and I want to see what happens. You know, Stay I feel tuned. like yeah, Vegas needs some some new energy. Yeah, in there right now. I mean, we would love we would love, but the gatekeepers are just kind of keeping it. You know, it's cool. You I, keep I that think they have their so formula. Rinse and repeat. Yeah. To, to me, it's kind of like when uh, like the auto industry wasn't accepting of like electri electronic cars. Yeah. Because there's so many people getting paid as the, you know, with gasoline and yeah. gas. Mm -hmm. right. So they're just kind of like, this is still working and people are still coming and, yeah. and paying for gas. And so why gas try anything cars. new why or whatever? Yeah. yeah. Why disrupt the system right now? I get it. Yeah. Yep. We yeah. run into that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yo, thanks. Thank you guys for Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having if us. You guys, awesome. If there's anything you guys need from us, let us know. What do you guys got? <laughs> I mean, shit. <laughs> whatever you need. And, and if, then, you're, if you're going out, to see like DJs and stuff, let me know. I'm down. All right, Ooh, let's do it. This is gonna be the new collective of like a the, sil the silent supporter. Yeah, just <laughs> a reconnaissance mission. Yeah. Just you chilling need to get in the like cut. a cool little disguise. Yeah. <laughs> trench coats. I'll yeah. Shave oh, in the, the mustache. trench coats. Both are here. We'll, we just we'll do it like a 30 minute. We'll go to the bar. We'll talk. We'll listen to the DJ and then we'll say hi. That's, that's, that's the perfect thing. Yeah. Yeah. I love Matt, it. Madison Chachi, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much. If you want to watch more episodes from Rogue Podcast, click either links on the left or the right. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube page and get updated on new uploads throughout the week. Peace.